uh, 15, 15, am I doing the math right here? 15, 16 years ago, I was asked to participate in a, a group that with the benefit of hindsight, um, I now realize helped push me in a whole different direction than I had been doing prior to that time. And, and I, am, I am eternally grateful for having had the opportunity to participate in that group, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit, little bit about in, in just a minute. Let me ask uh, online, um, um, Bill Lieber, can you very quickly say hello and introduce yourself? Failing that. Oh. Hey, you're on mute, Bill. How about now? Now, nah, there you go. Okay, I'm Bill. I'm now retired industry. Um, worked with Matt and uh, many of the folks you'll be hearing from today on the uh, way. Um, worked for Northwest Airlines, Ricky Martin, Passer Space. But I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Jim Evans, go. Thanks. Um, well, I'm, I'm working half time for uh, MIT Lincoln Lab, and I'm actually uh, on projects dealing with ATM weather integration. So it, it, this is a uh, look forward to our discussion. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Phil Smith, say hello, please. Hi, uh, I'm a professor at uh, Ohio State University. We're getting lots of feedback here, by the way. Um, and anyway, hopefully you can hear this, but I've uh, been doing work in air traffic flow management, airline operations control, and areas where weather is critical in terms of the decision making that's done, and then look forward to the discussion we're going to have today. Thank you, Phil. Gene? Hello, everybody. Uh, Gene Wilhelm here. I'm uh, quasi retired from MITRE. I've been working on ATM weather integration for, oh my goodness, I don't know how long, and with all of these other esteemed individuals. Um, and I hope that since I'm really old now, I hope that you guys there in a room can Push it over the line. Thank, thank you, Gene. Uh, okay, so we're a little behind, which means I'm going to have to talk even faster than usual. Um, this opening session in in Lee's overall um, session today is titled "Next Gen Weather Past," and um, I felt compelled to dig out the quote that uh, has has commonly been attributed to Churchill, but in fact came from George Santayana several years before that, several decades before that, about those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And, and so it's, 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 it's often good to take a trip back into the past and see what has gone on and see if there are any lessons that perhaps can be learned. Um, so um, what do we mean by next-gen weather? Well, we, we can't necessarily just mean better weather because in fact the the national weather service um is is not only charged with producing better weather but i think they do a great job of it on an ongoing basis as uh, as demonstrated by some of the key statistical measures that 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 they use to determine the the accuracy of of their product um so next gen weather means more than just more accurate weather. It, it means more than just um, um, taking advantage of modern graphics and, and of, of ways to um, present information. And, and in fact, as, as, um, as this discussion has been going on for more than 35 years now about uh, next-gen weather, there are a couple of key characteristics of that that, um, that, that I, I wanted to point out. One of those is this quote up there, which came from a document called the JPDO Next Gen ATM Weather Integration Plan version two, which was pushed out in September of 2010. And it talks about what is meant by ATM weather integration. And in, in to, to try to summarize it, it means 
whether information goes into either a decision process or a decision support system in such a way that it is turned into impact and then after it's been turned into impact it is um, in a in a highest level of ATM weather integration system, there is automation that determines how to best mitigate the impact caused by that particular weather constraint. Um, another uh, characteristic that was that was called out uh, routinely back in the development of this thing called next gen weather was this idea of a a modern and comprehensive source of weather information, which. Um, uh, when when this effort was perhaps at its heyday was called the four dimensional or 4D weather cube. And then yet another notion, which we, we've alluded to a couple of times over the last year or so was this idea of having a, a, um, a common source of weather information that's used for collaborative decision making or decision making that's gonna affect everybody. And this was called for many, many years, a single authoritative source. I must say that those last two terms have not just fallen out of favor, but they've fallen off the cliff and are nowhere to be found anymore as far as as far as a buzzword or a buzz phrase. But they're 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 important. 40 Weather Cube, I think Weather Service calls now. Help me out, Jennifer. Is it, is it integrated dissemination product or something? IDP, I think, is what the name of it is. Um, and you know, we've talked about SAS here, a single authoritative source, several times. Um, it's it, it seems like such a simple and great idea, and in fact, it is such a complex and difficult thing to to to, to wrestle to the ground. Uh, that having been said, I, I think my opinion, and I'm looking to, to to Bruce and Rick and the folks online. I think ATM this concept of ATM weather integration was considered to be the most critical of these. Um, so, oh, sorry. It's amazing. I. I, I I come up here and I can't operate my computer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Weather ATM Integration uh, Working Group, or WAYWIG. Um, it was a working group that was stood up by the um, the REDAC, the Research Engineering and Development Advisory Committee subgroup called the NAS Ops subgroup, and it was charged with, as the the, the working group's title implies, looking at the concept of weather ATM integration. It was formed in the fall of 2006. It was given 12 months to do its work. And in fact, it did report out in October of seven, uh, 2007, after which it was disbanded. Um, this is the, the primary lineup of the Weather ATM Integration Work Group. And the folks who are highlighted are in fact, either here in the room uh, or on the call. Kevin Johnson, I forgot you, dang it. Uh, We've heard from Kevin several times already, so uh, I'm I'm sure everybody knows Kevin. Um, I got, would point out. Go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. You forgot Rick. But that's okay. No, no, no. Rick's sitting here right next to me. Oh, okay. But I I don't I don't remember you introducing. Matt, you, right, you didn't introduce the folks on the table. Over. Anyway, but uh, yeah, at the time I was in weather service, came over to the FA in 2008. And to the what that firstly uh, in the FA with SysOps, but in 2019 moved over to the Aviation Weather Division. So, so Kevin has been uh, has been tilting at these windmills for quite some time too. Um, in 2007, uh, the the WayWig report came out, and uh, there is its URL. It still exists in the FA archives. You can look it up and and. Uh, it's a it's a neat read. You ought to go back and take a look at it. There's a lot of good stuff in that report. I'm pressing button. Go out. Okay. So what I want to do is um, is is just very briefly go over some of the key recommendations that came out of that weather ATM integration work working group without necessarily yet answering or trying to answer the question of okay, well, so how have things done since this report came out. So on the overarching side, um, and by the way, I cherry picked these um, because I just didn't want to have four slides worth of recommendations. So these are the ones that in, in my view kind of were key among the key recommendations. But uh, on the overarching side, there was a call to establish senior leadership of this notion of ATM weather integration and a monitoring by REDAC of progress in this area. Uh, there was a call to develop the um, uh, requirements through the Aviation Weather Research Program, currently led by uh, Randy Bass, 
uh, to support integration efforts. And then in the near term, which again, think, think back now, this is 2007, near term was considered 2007 to 2010, there was a, a recommendation that uh, convective weather be translated into ATC impacts. I, I, I think that we've, we've kind of done that. Um, there was a call to improve the airspace flow programs by developing six to 10 hour weather impacts forecasts. And in fact, uh, I believe that led to the, if I'm getting the timing right on this, and I'm looking at Bruce, because I know he was very involved in this, the development, the, the transition from CWIS to COSPA at that point in time. Um, there was a, a recommendation that weather input uh, into uh, collaborative traffic flow management be improved and that um, weather be integrated into airport and terminal area automation. And, by, and just a quick side <laughs> trip here. By integration, well, sorry, step back. I'll, I'll tell you what we mean by integration here just a little bit. Um, in the midterm from 2010 to 2015, uh, we were looking for uh, adaptive integrated ATM procedures for both incremental route planning and for tactical trajectories. Flexible, the development of flexible airspace for weather impacts as a fundamental ATM design requirement. In the far term, uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, Bill and Ray LaFray, who were the, the, the chief cooks and bottle washers, uh, uh, were smart in, in not putting a, an end date to this one because this just goes past 2015. Uh, the development of, of surrogates for uh, weather that that uh, that implies the true measures of flight impacts um, called for research to be conducted on both probabilistic sound familiar and deterministic forecasts for multiple dynamic flight lanes uh, research on both gridded and scenario based probabilistic weather data so even back then in ancient history sort of um, this probabilistic weather notion was bubbling up to the top and, and seen as very important uh, on the human factor side, there was a call to uh, to do research on the human factors aspects of ATM weather integration. We've talked about that several times over the last 24 hours, and then and then to go out in the field and find find the the facilities that that handled weather the best and what find out what those practices were and spread them throughout the the uh, the NAS and the ATO. On the, on the FAA and next-gen enterprise architecture side, there was a, a, a recommendation that, um, that direct ATM automation weather integration be a key focus of the development of, again, a lost term, the OEP, the something evolution plan, but I forget what the operational evolution plan. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, the, and the NAS enterprise architecture views um, for transition to next-gen. So basically a call to you know, don't just talk about this on the side. Let's actually show it in our in our key system engineering documentation. And on the AWRP side, increased support uh, to that uh, uh, branch to enable participation and 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 mm, uh, help to promote this idea of joint ATM weather integration research. So a, a lot of really good stuff came out of that. And. Um, Ray LaFray, who's not here with us today, uh, but who again, along with Bill Lieber, was a, a kind of key in putting together the report, told me in a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago that he was told by, by John Hansman, the, uh, the REDAC chair at that point in time, that, that the report of the Weather ATM Integration Work Group was clearly the best report out that they'd ever had done by a working group. So it was by, I, I think, a fairly well-respected academician and, and, and FAA influencer was seen as a, a very important report. Um, so, uh, excuse me. Yes, sir. Can I, can I ask a question? Uh, the, uh, the FAA was required uh, to answer the, the report uh, to read at. Uh, do we have the the document that the FAA produced? So, um, if answering the REDAC report, if the FAA's answer to the REDAC report is what I think it is, then the answer, I think, is yes. 
but bear with me a second here, uh, Gene, and, and I'll get to that and see if that if that answers the mail. Um, okay. Slightly prior to the formation of the Weather ATM Integration Work Group, uh, but but spanning after it was disbanded, the Joint Planning and Development Office stood up a weather integrated product team, and several of the uh, members of the WayWig were also on. The, the weather IPT, I believe you were, correct, Bruce, on the IPT? I think Gene was, and, and I, I'm not certain how many of the other folks on this call were also. Um, but uh, but the, the JPDO, uh, which was involved in all aspects of, of the Next Gen or NGATS at that time program, uh, <laughs> too many buttons to push, what was about, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of the timing, the, the next gen opportunities, and making tough decisions um, on behalf of the entire NAS. Um, there are a bunch of documents still out there today that you can uh, that, that you can Google and pull out of the deep archives and take a look at. With regards to the aviation weather IPT, uh, there were several points that were raised by uh, uh, that, that were that were listed by JPDO as important. Two of those have happened to do with a couple of those um, uh, characteristics that I mentioned earlier. One in particular, the integration piece, the critical joining of weather with ATM information rising uh, uh, well to the top of the list there. And Gene, I hope this is what you're referring to. Uh, there was an ATM weather integration plan put out uh, under the auspices of the JPDO in both, I believe it was 29, uh, and then a, an up-numbered version two in 2010. This was an effort led by Dave Pace from the uh, Aviation Weather Division that uh, that, that uh, Rick was leading at the time, and uh, it was also as a, a very interesting to me side note. Um, it was also the catalyst for the formation of the FAA's Weather COI in the 2008-2009 timeframe. Now that particular version of the Weather COI, the Weather Community of Interest. Uh, was a single issue group, and when version two of this plan came out and it was apparently deemed as having answered the mail, then the weather COI was disbanded and remained dormant for mm, nearly 10 years before being resurrected again by Bill and Alfred Musikanian in, help me out, Bill, 2020, correct? In the summer of 2020. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Matt, the document. I was act, or ax, actually asking about at a very high level in the FAA, they had to answer each of the REDAC recommendations, and they actually had to, they were obligated to create answers and I want I haven't ever seen the actual um, report of those answers um, and I was wondering uh, if it's around. So Rick, Gene, I am. Rick, 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 I am unaware of I, I do not know if or where that document exists. Yeah, it would be with REDAC, uh, Matt. <clears throat> they were required by law to respond, as Gene has uh, mentioned. So, M Matthias, are you taking your usual copious and good notes? Oh. <laughs> Can you mark that down somewhere for me, please? I'd like to follow up and at least be able to, to respond to, to, to Gene and, and, the, and the question on the FPAS side. Okay, we heard um, uh, reference uh, when Lee was introducing us to the uh, ketchup mustard chart. Um, out of this weather ATM integration work, uh, it became apparent that that talking about what this stuff meant was much less effective than actually showing more or less how it could all be laid out. And so um, a, a group of us here, uh, both at MITRE and at the FAA, and, and I'm a shout out to Gene Wilhelm, who's asked the questions. Mark Huberdeau, who was here yesterday, and Claudia McKnight sitting over on the side table for 
their significant contributions to the, the world famous uh, ketchup mustard chart, which was first introduced at a AMS meeting, if I remember correctly, in uh, 2010. I, I think maybe even in Atlanta, if I remember the, the timing and location right. Um, and um, a, a name that's going to be out of pass for many of you people, uh, uh, Kurt Kaler from uh, Minneapolis Center was in the audience, and I, I think he saw it and said, man, that looks like a ketchup and mustard thing, and it stuck, and that's kind of what it's been known as uh, ever since. But uh, several things I want to point out on here. Um, is it me? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Very well. Uh, so, um, so, so what this... What what this document does, what this what this graphic does, is is try to show um, how w raw weather information comes in and then is transformed in a couple of ways uh, into something other than raw weather information. So here is our raw weather information on the left side of the graphic, uh, presumably coming from the 4D weather cube. Uh, that information was thought to flow toward the uh, the the both FAA and external users. And if it is going to be integrated, that weather information was going to be translated into either NAS constraint information, that is like potential or hypothetical uh, constraint information caused by weather, or NAS threshold events, that is potential or, or, um, or hypothetical changes in weather that cause a significant operational change in, in response. For instance, a front comes through and changes the direction of the wind, and all of a sudden the runway that we're on right now, instead of having a headwind, has more than 10 knots of tailwind, and we have to get off of it to, to get onto a landable runway configuration. So that, that is what the notion of translation was thought to be. Then when you get over past this middle portion of the diagram into the right side, the red and the brown colored side, the, the ATM impact conversion or calculation is basically taking that translated weather information and adding actual or projected air traffic on top of it to, to, to understand what the full impact of that weather information is. And then in the final uh, portion over here is the notion of having decision support technology that takes that information out of the red box and says, okay, here's the best way for you to deal with this problem that we see coming on that is that is weather-based. Um, this this doc this this picture was probably from the 2010 2009 2010 time period. So uh, it was it was a, a first cut at this, and over the years it evolved internally here at MITRE, but didn't actually go back out into the broader community very much after that. So this is the this is the picture that that most everybody has seen. Um, in in looking at, okay, so we have this ketchup and mustard chart picture of ATM weather integration. What if we wanted to say, go to ATM systems and say, okay, you uh, represent a level of integration of X or Y or Z. How, how would we actually do that? And so we, we came up with this notion of levels of weather, weather integration. So um, no integration, or if you will, a level zero integration is when weather information is in a separate standalone display and the human being has to do all of the cognitive work to superimpose it with traffic, to translate the impact of the, the weather information, to then understand what the impact of that weather translation is on the actual traffic that are out there and then figure out the right solution. And, and any traffic managers on the call I believe would be happy to say that that is a non-trivial problem. It is a hard thing to do in your head, and yet that, that is the way we have been operating the NAS for many, many, many years. So as, as part of the, the steps toward integration as we saw it, um, we designated a level one or weather on the glass level of integration in which traffic and weather are superimposed on the same place and at least the, the human uh, can see that and understand what the relationship is between weather and and aircraft before doing all those other things that I mentioned, um, translation, impact conversion, and then come up with solutions. It's when we get into level two, three, and four uh, ATM weather integration that we are talking about leveraging automation in the way that the, the folks who were involved in this project from the very beginning uh, were, were interested in, in seeing take place and that we think is still the appropriate direction to go.
So if you take that information and you kind of update and 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 modernize the ketchup and mustard chart, you can come up with something like this, which recognizes that, that there's AD, uh, IDP out there providing the raw weather information that in some cases it's going to standalone uh, displays or or uh, uh, alphanumeric information, and it's, that'll be considered level zero integration. Some uh, some of that is going on the glass. It would be considered level one. And then again, as you move your way in, into the diagram from left to right, you get into the higher and higher levels of weather integration. And props to Bob Abgen also on the side table for his many inputs to to this version of the ketchup and mustard chart. So Jim Evans, I'm now going to hand this over to you and and let you talk a little bit. Although Lee's going to glare at me here in very in just a few minutes if we don't hustle, let you talk a little bit about how things have worked out in practice for us. Uh, Jim, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Look, there's been some there's been some op operational success of putting products up on display and letting people make decisions. There has been little progress on modeling of what pilots will avoid. But when you actually start trying to go into level the level four type thing, which is was a departure aid called root availability planning tool. It got it got put in at New York, O'Hare, Philadelphia, and Washington, but we don't know really whether it's being used effectively. There was a SFO marine stratus decision support um, that had a probabilistic forecast. It turned out the probabilistic forecast hadn't changed the behavior in GDPs very much until um, some people addressed um, the, the a back end planner that actually made GDP recommendations and did risk management. But that got turned off and and there was really, I think the lack of support, well, the one answer was finances, but uh, Kevin has also pointed out that there were union people at the command center who didn't like it because they felt it was a job killer or something like that. Um, and, and that yet that was doing a really wonderful job. And I think I would flag that because that was the first one People say, I want a probabilistic forecast. Fine, translate that into a deterministic solution. You have to do risk management and nobody has done it except for GPSM. Uh, and, and so that's been an ongoing problem. We, we tell people you have to pick GDP and AFP parameters and at the best you get a probabilistic forecast and, and the worst you don't even get that, at, at least not a validated one. Um, and, and how do you come to a real answer? Then let's start to another problem. Who's responsible? Is it weather or TFM? Who cares about training? We've had tremendous turnover. How do you use these things to make decisions? And how do you update it? Okay, that's not obvious. And then there, there was a lot of hubris that we could build models for airspace usage. It would be something capacity. And if you just look at what's been done, it's been very hard to prove that the models work well. So it's not so easy. Let me give an example, next slide. CWIS came online as a prototype and actually has <laughs> continued operating as a prototype while we wait for next gen weather processor to appear. If, if I compare what happens with CWIS, um, it doesn't have an ATM model, but look at what it does. It trains people, not just in how to use the display, but how to use them to make decisions, and, and there's a big difference. If we looked at what was done when RAP was a prototype, yes, there was training in the display. Every year you talk about scenarios for making decisions. You had an online RCAF, you could see, is it actually changing the decisions? Come on, a weather forecast has value only if it changes the decision. Do we know whether these things are changing decisions? Who's tracking it? And so, the prototype had all kinds of goodies. What has the wrap, which was a, a poster child in 2007, have as a production system? I have no idea whether Philadelphia and Potomac are actually using it. I haven't seen any reports. Um, and if you just look at, at this whole string of no's, that's part of the problem. We, we need to have not just R&D, but something that follows it through to operation 
and then iterates because the world keeps changing. Next slide. So just looking at what I'm aware of that we put in place back over the last few years, um, you need to be coupling to the key operational decision makers. And that means, for example, if I have a, a AFP, folks, the people who, who are going to take the heat, if you don't get it right, is the RC. It's not the command center. Command center is not in charge of separation of traffic. The key issue you have to address is, do we have a manageable controller workload? How do you handle forecast uncertainty? And look, we've got AI coming on strong. Where is this single authoritative source where people have complicated AI algorithms that are looking at all kinds of stuff? Um, and I would say one thing to do is think about good practices. And one of the things I've been impressed about is how Atlanta uses the CWSU to really help make ATM decisions. And that says, don't just think about something that goes to the TFM, think about something that goes to the CWSU so they can help the TFM people. Then we come to post-event assessment. Purdy claimed to be plan, execute, review, train, and improve. What I'm I guess concern is I'm not sure that review, train, and improve is existing for the kind of tactical and even strategic ATM. Um, because I, as for example, WAP, tell me is WAP being used or not? I, I don't know. Um, and then there's this issue about who's in charge. Right now, the sense is if it's done by AWRP, they don't want it something that spits out rates. When you then say, well, well, does system is system operations going to do the R and D? Not clear. Um, the uh, I believe the uh, GPSM was actually done with NASA funding, but then what happens? NASA throws it over the wall to the FAA. Who's dealing with ongoing maintenance and refinement and operational usage training? Falls falls off a cliff. So. If I just take a look at things we tried to do and where they stand, here's some thoughts. So this is a feedback into, I think, the next segment. Lee, how much time can you can you give me uh, to have a I, panel and audience discussion? Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably run this session till two o'clock. Okay, we, we have oh, about- you, uh, you are a generous person. <laughs> Thank you. So the- that was the lead in to uh, panel and audience discussion. And, and I have just some some very easy fundamental questions that I've teed up and, and actually on a couple of slides have some answers back from one or more of the panelists that, that you've just heard from either uh, here in person or or in uh, on, on the virtual side. So so how have we done at ATM weather integration? I would suggest. Um, so far, not so good. But I'm going to open it up to Rick or Bruce or or any of my esteemed Waywig colleagues who are online. Bruce, you want to? All right, well, <clears throat> never uh, bashful about jumping in the middle of the swamp. Um, let, let me just uh, review a little bit of history, which I, I think is important to kind of understand. We <clears throat> There were a number of us uh, at NCAR, at Lincoln, and at MITRE uh, who got very um, interested in ATM weather integration back in about 2000. And Greg Burke, who was then AUA1, I believe, was our kind of our sponsor. And we held five different working group sessions uh, here at MITRE, at NCAR, at Lincoln, and a couple of other places, uh, trying to uh, grapple with this question of weather integration and how we could make it get off the starting blocks. <clears throat> and we, we really never could get any traction. So, um, 
not having gotten any traction, we were all thrilled to death when uh, there was a presidential mandate to have a joint planning and development office. And we saw in that the opportunity to get some traction for ATM weather integration. And as Matt pointed out, that was a key part of the uh, effort of the of the weather working group. And uh, so some of us uh, essentially mortgaged our house and and lived in Washington when we normally lived in Colorado. Uh, we lived at 15th and K at the JPDO facility there and worked. Uh, every, it was an every week come out on Monday, go back on Friday uh, situation for me, heart and soul into coming up with a concept for next gen weather, including the ATM weather integration. Um, and Gene was actually the the straw boss of that particular part of the work. And uh, Kevin and I did the uh, weather forecasting part. So. Um, Anyway, we we worked hard. We worked with the other parts of the JPDO, and we coordinated in minute detail uh, planning and uh, airspace management, and and so the JPDO came out with a, a work plan which was uh, a, a mile high stack of paper down to the task level. Uh, what we didn't realize was that there was no way in hell the five agencies were going to let any of this happen. Uh, we thought the JPDO implied that they were going to get the money and they were going to manage the project. Not going to happen. FAA was not going to let the JPDO manage their money and their project. Neither was NOAA, neither was going to DOD. So each agency then, uh, they really liked the, the plan as long as it meant that they got the money. But they didn't really feel like they had to do the plan. It was just sort of a way to get the money from Congress. And at that point in time, the JPDO sort of lost all of its teeth and and had no way to to move forward, and so I think the JPDO's plan fell into a giant abyss, uh, sort of never to be seen again. Um, and that's about when the, this uh, working group that we were on, the weather ATM working group, kind of got cranked up. It it was almost as a a challenge to the FAA: Are you going to do this or not? And uh, the fact that we we didn't see the FAA's response to the uh, to the redac uh, document, I think, is a, is a good indication of sort of how they uh, felt about and reacted to the redac work. So, uh, Rick, uh, what's uh, FAA's perspective on on these? <laughs> it's very hard for me. It's hard for me to tell, being four years out, but. Uh, first of all, I want to say this is a very good presentation. I think of the history and the, and the uh, issues and, and the process. So thank you for that. I, I, I would really defer in answering the question about how have we done. I would defer to Kevin. I think Kevin is probably the most knowledgeable weather and uh, with his fingers in, in the pie. And of course, Bill now is uh, doing a lot of that as well. So let me defer to them on the, how are we doing. That, that was a handoff, Kevin. How are we doing? Yeah, that was really yeah, smooth. That was really smooth. Right. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but no, I get it. Uh, you've been out for a while, but yeah, and I think I have kind of a unique aspect in that, you know, I moved from the weather service after we did that initial work and, you know, came over to SysOps. Um, but yeah, no, I would agree with what Matt had on his slide and and Bruce's summary. You know, not much has happened. You know, we had some some good efforts, um, but it's just it just hasn't happened. I mean, I do think the GPSM was uh, probably the best example of. Uh, ATM and weather integration and and it just had uh, 
it just fell flat. I mean, there was some good work that was done to do some testing of it. Uh, and then when investment decisions were, were being made, uh, there were folks that stepped in and, and basically said, we, we don't want it. And it mostly came from FAA, but I saw it when the program manager said, hey, I, I need to make a decision. We going to fund it or not? He even solicited uh, input from industry and industry said, we'd rather see investments and in improving the, the meteorology uh, component of it and, and not go down the path of, of doing any kind of trans translation and, and true integration and it, and it just fell flat. You know, I think um, more recently there's been some interest in, in trying to bring it uh, back online. Uh, since then, I've, you know, I left SysOps and uh, yeah, so, you know, personally, it's been somewhat frustrating to really not see these things take root. I'd actually like to Sorry, I'd actually like to uh, to move on from this and and um, but but mention that when I was on the weather ATM integration work group, I was a uh, an employee of Delta Airlines, um, and since then I've mostly been an employee of uh, the MITRE Corporation Center for Advanced Aviation System Development, whose customer is the FAA. And in the course of, of that period of time, uh, I've discovered I have a lot in common with Patty Hurst. Uh, that is to say that, that, that uh, I got a little bit of Stockholm Syndrome going here, and, 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 which is a roundabout way of saying I kind of understand now how hard it is. So it is not my intention to, to be dumping on the FAA right now by any means, because this is this is a non-trivial, hard problem for the agency to resolve, given a variety of factors over which the MET community has zero control or influence. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and say hey, that it's, it's not trivial. Hey, hey Matt, before you, you move on, I want to throw in a comment. Um, so, so I would agree that the advances in the integration using technology of, of, of weather and, and uh, TFM actions hasn't progressed very far. But what has happened that sets the stage for, for future advances is the introduction of or the future introduction of new kinds of TMIs. So AFPs, as a historical example, which is used very widely, provides a new set of choices and mechanisms for the traffic manager to choose from, select from, guided by weather information. And, and that the introduction of AFPs is an advance in the ability to use weather. Um, similarly, the, the surface CDM concept, which is being implemented under TFDM very shortly, um, provides an opportunity to use weather in much more sophisticated ways. And so I think there have been advances that give us the opportunity to talk about more advanced forms of, of aviation weather integration um, than we've had in the past, and that those new initiatives themselves have been very beneficial or will be very beneficial. Thank you, Phil. That's a great comment and also a wonderful segue into uh, your, your presentation just a little bit later on this afternoon. But let me let me uh, uh, so for the audience here, um, you know, a, a lot of these folks, Rick is retired and Bruce is retired and, and I, I just felt bad asking them to do stuff while they're retired. So I didn't and, and thought to myself, well, I can I can handle this. I can get it all down on paper. And then as is typically the case with me, I started running out of time and ideas and I had to late in the game, reach out to this gang and say, sorry, I, I, I told you I wasn't going to ask you to do stuff, but I need you to do stuff for me here now. Can you can you can you give me some input on, you know, on this overall question? And, and there were some just just marvelous back and forth email exchanges. Phil and Rick, by the way, at the time I started this, I didn't have your emails with me. I couldn't for the life of them. And yours is like so easy. I couldn't remember them that. And so I didn't copy you in on this, but I will I will 
post facto uh, forward those emails to you so you can see them also. But um, here were some of the some of the kind of key themes that came out of these email exchanges that we as a group of five or six people were having at that point in time about why the ATM weather integration piece uh, hasn't hasn't gone further than we would have liked. And uh, again, let me just open it up to uh, to the folks online and, and here on the table. Uh, if you want to uh, elaborate on any of these, I, I frankly find the human factors related ones to be just fascinating. And in my head, they feel like they're way more difficult to solve than the technological or even budgetary problems associated with this. Well, Matt, I can jump in there if uh, if you like. Thank you, Bill. I I'll call these my top five reasons for failure. And I think we covered the first uh, fully. Um, see, is an Achilles heel, no doubt. I won't say, I won't go further with it. But I think we have to overcome these things um, <clears throat> because to quote a uh, the first astronaut, uh, female astronaut from India, Kalpana Chawla, the path from dreams to success really does exist. Um, unfortunately, she perished in 2003 in the tragedy of Columbia's reentry. But I do think this this can happen. I think in the back in the day we had to try to make things happen uh, because things were falling apart so badly, and we've been given this sort of. Uh, relaxation and demand. But the other ones that I think are critical beyond executive advocacy, which we could talk about all day, is labor participation and accountability. So we had a lot of that. We had a lot of NAC involvement. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a lot of the people um, who you need in the room were not in the room even so. And uh, <clears throat> You know, labor must participate uh, and they must not be given veto power. Uh, and, I, and I don't just mean NATCA. It, it, there are unions at airlines, too. And if 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 that happens, then you're you're really spinning your wheels because right up to the very end, after all the money spent and the capabilities in front of the decision makers, you have an open door to political sabotage. So you don't want that. You have to have buy in from the start. And efforts were made, but um, there were there were problems there for sure. Um, the next huge one is regulatory compliance. So <clears throat> you won't see regulatory compliance on a lot of presentations about weather ATM integration. But respect for the regulatory scheme is essential. And CFR 14 FAR 121 is still the law. So if you're going to abide by the law and you're not going to run the NAS unlawfully, which we do, um, I'll even make the bold statement, a ground stop is even an unlawful action by some legal definition. You have to have a regulatory scheme that either is brought up to date, and <clears throat> but in either case, even if it's not changed, it has to be lived up to. So um, <clears throat> rulemaking or not, the participants um, need to understand that what the law is and um, that if they don't, if they're not trained on the regulatory scheme, then the result is chaos. And we saw a lot of that. Um, so that takes us to the next big one, which is training. And I mean, CDM did a lot of work there. They'd had a lot of success in getting S2K training, but historically training, and Gene might want to weigh in here, training is always the first thing to be cut. Um, <clears throat> uh, the skills that we're looking for in the traffic managers are very different from what we see them being um, screened for in controllers. It's, it's almost as though you have to take a really good controller and deprogram them to become not a <clears throat> deterministic thinker, but a probabilistic manager. And we don't do that. And so we get what, what you would expect in many cases. Um, so without proper training, even with all the right tools, 
um, you still get failure. And then lastly, um, I'll say, um, is you, you've got to know the very specific responsibilities of the decision makers involved. And that goes to traffic managers, dispatchers, and pilots. So <clears throat> for traffic managers, um, they have to know their airspace like no one else. And NAS status and CDM was trying to get at that. Um, but if you raise the word capacity, you immediately fell into um, a vagueness and an uncertainty. And so without knowing your airspace, without knowing your, your nominal capacity, it was very hard, if not impossible, to know your off nominal capacity. So um, that made it impossible to do other more sophisticated things that we could talk about um, in the next section. Uh, but you have to be able to take limited action in advance in time. And otherwise, everything goes tactical and all you've got is the pilot controller paradigm. Enough said. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was that was great. And for those of you who don't know Bill, who's kind of been out of our um, our area for for quite some time now, um, he's a big thinker. He's a bold thinker, and and a really good guy to boot. Um, and um, Deb, I don't know if you know, but uh, Bill was among the founders of ADF many, 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 many moons ago, and also a, a key figure in the formation of CDM even more many moons ago before that. So uh, somebody who's been intimately involved. OK, Lee, I'm going to hustle, I promise. Where are we? I think we can just say not very far and move along from there. And then Jim, wrap us up. Uh, uh, you've got some ideas on making progress in this area. Jim Evans, are you with us? Jim, let's see. I can see him. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Are, are his lips moving? Yeah, he's freezing. Jim, can you unmute, please? Okay. All right. Well, I will do my. I will channel my inner Jim as best I can. Um, in, in, in the in the opening statement, Jim has said that. Um, asserts that ATM weather integration only has a benefit one way or another if it changes the decision or if it influences the decision. And so what he's asking in the second bullet is, is um, which, which types of current decisions uh, could ATM weather integration change and lead to better operational outcomes? And he again mentions uh, GPSM as, uh, as an area where that attempt was made, but uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, did not did not stay uh, in in um, uh, the toolkit. Um, uh, wrapped, um, you know, using it to to depict when uh, to uh, when to show the end of a convective impact, and uh, as opposed to using pathfinders always to reopen departure routes. Uh, even the uh, the dynamic route for arrivals and weather, the draw program that American Airlines used uh, to uh, to plan more efficient alternative, um, uh, I believe it was arrival routes into Dallas, uh, and nope. then departures. Okay, well I I see it says that, but when I look up the name of it, it says arrivals, so I'm confused. But go ahead, Jim. It's it's departures. Okay. It's when they, they the depart normal departure routes block. Well, you, if you can pick it up from here and take us home, Jim, that would be great. I can't. My my system has gone down, so you're going to have to do it. I can't. Oh, Roger can't that. Okay. Thank thank you, sir. So uh, uh, so finally, to close, additional factors that need to be considered uh, in in identifying opportunities to. Uh, uh, apply ATM weather integration, uh, how much uncertainty exists in the forecast. Uh, is is there, to Jim's earlier point, any 
Okay. Any uh, risk management that can hey, uh, be uh, I'm, provided? I'm back. Okay. I'm back. Well, look, GP, let me make a comment. GPSM was actually the the TMU at the Oakland Center actually was for it. The problem was the command center. And, and I asked the question, why is the command center involved in, 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 in making that choice? That's a, a problem. But look, Right now, everybody and their cousin can put together an AI system and try to create a probabilistic forecast. So how do we, if we're going to identify opportunities, figure out how risk management is going to happen and be wary about capacity. But I, I, I think, we, you know, we can't have throwing a probabilistic information out and then say, oh, you met, you, you, uh, TMUs who often don't have formal training and probability, you're going to do the risk management. H how, how can we meaningfully manage risks? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I believe, Lee, but that's it. Okay. Oh. Uh, I'm actually going to suggest we leave the, you know, if after 4 p.m. as we're in a plan, we can have some discussion to the very end. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, uh, we did a poor time management, but uh, let's come back at 2.10 to start the next part. And thank you for the uh, first part, panelists. Thank, thank you, Lee. Okay, everyone, call for order now. <laughs> Okay, our next part is about uh, the current uh, development of status updates uh, about uh, the, the next gen related uh, uh, development. Probably not exactly along the lines of original plan, the vision of next gen, but th these are the real effort telling success, the way that works. Uh, some successful examples, I have a Bill Bowman, FAA, uh, Mike uh, Emmanuel, FA, and Joshua Sheck from uh, NWS Aviation Weather Center. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Bill Bowman. Thanks, Lee. Wow, everybody got quiet. With that. <laughs> Imagine that. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it was good to hear that conversation about the, the integration, and that was sort of what I was supposed to be speaking about but I'm going to talk more about technology transition and translation based on experiences I've had with it and where I think we need to go with it, because there are some very strict rules if you want to have successful transition and translation, and I'll explain my view of the difference and what we need to do to follow it. And the previous discussion, Bill especially hit on a number of those resources, training, and things like that. So next slide, please. Next slide, please, for time. So one of the problems in the FAA is that we, like other organizations, are split up into silos. And there's two big ones. There's research and operations. And that red dotted line is that we will not cross. The researchers are on one side. The operations folks are on the other side. We're doing our thing. We're all doing little bits and pieces of weather. But if we don't communicate, if we don't talk to each other, if the meteorologists and the operators don't talk to each other and don't know what their missions are, what their capabilities are or are not, we're going to fail. Next slide. There it is. So when I was transitioning into the FAA and Rick was spinning me up on how to be a division manager in the FAA, it was administrivia and people and branches and how you take care of that. And then he said, let me talk to you about the mustard ketchup or ketchup mustard or whatever. And I was like, hot dogs and hamburgers? What, what are you talking about here? And then next slide, he showed me a chart to describe it. And look at the date in the bottom corner there. My old friend and colleague, Dave Pace, who was mentioned earlier, 2011. This was something that David briefed. This was the former weather community of interest. There's the 4D data cube. And Rick explained to me how we go from the 4D data cube, all the weather information through the mustard, the ketchup, and over to the decision. I was like, 
I know how to do that. I've been doing tech transition for 20 years. I didn't know how to do it for what the FAA needed for the operator. And I'll explain why in a minute. I even had an argument with our chief scientist, Mr. Bradford, which I lost, but you don't often win with Mr. Bradford. And there was a good reason I lost because I was talking about transition, which was my experience. And he was talking about translation, getting over to that brown side over there. Next slide, please. So to manage transition or translation, there are four things you have to do. And I'll explain where this experience comes from for me from programs I worked on with NASA. The real customer requirement, and that was brought up in the, in the previous discussion. You can't undertake tech transition unless there's a clear customer requirement for it. If you deliver something, because I'm the meteorologist, I know you wanna see 256 colors of radar on your scope, so you can get every little detail of that, here you go. They're not gonna use it because that's not what the customer asked for. When the requirement's clear, you have to meet it. If you build something that doesn't perform to what somebody's asking for, you've wasted your resources and they won't use it. Speaking of resources, you have to have adequate resources. We heard that senior leadership didn't necessarily wanna provide resources in JTBO. Each agency had their own thing to do. Um, it's got to be fully funded. It's got to be fully staffed. And there's multiple components. There's the research side that has to be funded. And there's the operations side that has to be funded through O&M and through training. And that has to continue. Bill, in the previous discussion, mentioned customer buy-in. You're dead without that. If you don't have your customer, number one, needing the requirement and working with you, and working with you all the way along until delivery and then use, you're gonna fail as well. And that's true whether you're transitioning a weather product or a capability to a non-MET to use. It's the same rules. Next slide, please. So the elements that I worked on in my previous experience with NASA are, are listed here. So these are the things that you need to do going through the tech transition or translation process. You have to do your evaluation, develop a CONOPS. You gotta know where you're going. You've got to tailor it for the customer. It's got to be very specific to meet their requirement, as I mentioned before. Installation at the operational site kind of goes without saying, but if you leave things in the lab forever, maybe people won't use it either. Although CWIS is a good example of how it's working and it's still in the lab. Acceptance testing, you've got to test it and work on it. And I know Mike sitting to my right over here is going to talk about with the success we've had with terminal precip on the glass. Acceptance testing has been going on in the lab. Training, and Bill mentioned it in the previous, that's the first thing to get cut. And those of us from a military background, I know Randy and Everett and others, when money gets tight, what do we cut? Training, always cut training, you can't do that. If you don't train the folks, you're not gonna use it either. Next slide. So let me talk a little bit about the difference in transition and translation, okay? So they're pretty much the same. But if we look at the FAA for customer-driven tasking for transition, the NAS stakeholders using MET capabilities, where you take a weather capability, transition a weather capability for a meteorologist to use and maybe interpret that for somebody else. You could even extend that maybe to flight service stations. But that's not the end customer. You're transitioning a MET capability for MET usage. Managed and funded independent of operational units you never, never, never can have the operational unit fund the research because guess what? When there's an operational need that comes up, what's the first thing they're gonna cut? Research funding. So the research has to be funded separately, which we do through AWRP and WIC. So that's a smart way to do that. High skill level with flexible skill mitts. So you have to work with pilots, dispatchers, meteorologists, engineers, human factors. When I was moving over to the weather division, I didn't realize there were about 30 employees. I thought, said the director, man, we got a lot of meteorologists over there I didn't know about. No, we don't. We have human factors people. We have engineers. Actually, we have very few METs. I was like, well, how can you have a weather division with very few meteorologists? I quickly learned you need that diversity of that mix of people that have that experience to include pilots that we have within the division. Customer involved throughout the process. We talk about bridging the gap, uh, the valley of death, you can't build it and throw it to the other side. You gotta build a little, test a little, work with your customer, make sure that they understand what you're doing as you go through the process before you deliver it. 
Co-location with an operational facility, that's the hardest thing I think in the FAA to do. And the examples I'm gonna give the researchers and the operators and the university was co-located, which is critically important. And again, that was mentioned in the previous discussion. You've gotta get the researchers out of the lab to go sit with the operators and the operators to see what the researchers do. And that's the way to learn and, and you get better transition. Next slide, please. So this is translation. It's the same basic idea, except the customer driven tasking, in my mind, is the most important difference for translation. For the FAA, it's the ATO. It's not the meteorologist, it's not the CWSU, it's not the NAMS, it's the air traffic services folks with mission support. We need to know what the operator in the field, in the tower, in the TRACON needs for weather. Problem is, they usually don't know. When we started talking about weather on the glass, and we said, what do you mean? They said, you know, weather. Okay, so you want vorticity. Uh, no, 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 weather, like rain and stuff. Okay, so you don't know what you need, but the meteorologists want to give you something you don't want. You've got to understand that to end up with a translated capability that's not weather, it's a decision support tool. The rest of this is pretty similar. The funding should come separately. It should be from the research organization. The skill mix is a little bit different because now you want the operators, the controllers, be deeply involved in the process as you go along to develop a translated capability. Next slide. So here are some transition examples. Previous places I worked, the NASA Applied Meteorology Unit at Kennedy Space Center. I was the, a contractor, program manager for that for 12 years and for NASA Sport for about four years. And if you look at the NASA Sport diagram there, that's basically what I just said in bullet format. Identify a problem and notice the word forecast has a box around it there. And then you go through the process of working with your customer until you transition it. The applied meteorology unit was the same way. You want to identify the forecast problem and work with your customer. So who's your customer in this case? Next slide. It's us, it's the meteorologists. We were developing capability. For, sorry, Frankie, this isn't Frankie, this is me. I'm the, I'm the nerd guy here. Developing a, tr you're transitioning a technology to the meteorologist to use to help their customers. And that's a lot different than what we're trying to do for integrating into ATM. Next slide. So, Randy, this is you. How do we do tech transition in the FAA? Most of it, not all of it, Gary Wittick is a, an example, which I'm not going to use here. You guys do that. program, we're doing research to transition capabilities to the National Weather Service, mostly AWC, to provide a capability to forecasters to give information to the users. So who's the customer here on the next slide? Same nerds, it's mostly the meteorologists. Next slide, but there's also one other customer here. You sort of kind of have pilots as we talked about a lot, I know. that. I couldn't find a good picture of a female costume when I looked on Google. So it's a costume, actually. That's a that's a Halloween costume. Okay, I was I was actually going to use a picture of Marilyn on this because she would be one of those customers where you're training people and you're you're providing information to pilots. But again, it's not that translated capability. Next slide. So how do we? translate a capability. Here's an example where you've got a TAF on the left side. Who wants to read that thing and interpret it when you can have a nice capability that's shown on the right side, which shows your runway configuration, your probabilities of crosswinds, gust winds, tailwinds, and when that might change and when your runway might be green or red, depending what direction you are. This is actually an example of something that was developed, but it's never been delivered. And in my opinion, there's a very good reason for that. No customer buy-in. We were working off of more strategic planning. There were strategic plans saying you needed a capability similar to this. We had one airport. This was actually Atlanta CWSU. MITRE helped us with this. This is a beautiful capability where you can take almost any forecast product and make a decision support tool. You don't need a MET anymore. If you took this to the end and had a pure decision support tool, in my opinion, 
a controller could look at that and go, here's what I'm green on this runway configuration at my airport. In three hours, I need to turn it and I can plan for it. Much harder to do with the TAF. If at the very beginning we had customers screaming for this, it would probably be operational right now. Next slide. There's the customer for translation, the controller. They don't want to see MET products. They want to see a decision support tool. That's the ultimate end of integration where you give them a capability, whether it's a stoplight chart, whether it's probabilities where they can say, well, in three hours, we're going to go green on this runway or, or that runway or whatnot. We saw a failure with GPSM, as Kevin was saying in Jim. Maybe we didn't have the customer buy-in on that either. So we really need to think about the full end of transition to translation and following those rules to get the customer to say, I need this and I want it. Even if it's not a customer requirement initially, the labs have great ideas. They may have a solution to a problem you don't know you have, but you still have to get the customer buy-in to sell it to them, like an iPhone in 2007. Who said they needed an iPhone then? Well, Apple did, and they convinced us we did. Next slide. So what's the problem? Address the real customer requirement. We can't build stuff the customer doesn't want or they're not asking for. And I said that before. Don't undertake your tech transition or translation unless there's a clear requirement. How do we sync ATO with NextGen? Does the user know they have a weather issue or there could be a solution that they're not aware of? If you're not working with them, they could be sit there grumbling and saying, boy, I wish I had lightning on my scope. If nobody hears that and they don't communicate it, it'll never get done. And to my next bullet, does the user know how to ask for that help? Not sure. Does the researcher know what issues the user has? Not if they're not sitting with them or don't hear from them. We can go build stuff and if they don't need it, you know, what's the point? And is the researcher working on solutions for problems that don't exist? My last job in the Air Force, I was the chief meteorologist at the Air Force Research Lab. We got requirements from the field and we brought those to the geophysics lab, then Air Force Research Lab weather. They didn't act on them. They did their own stuff, played in their own sandbox. When I was there, just before I retired from the Air Force, they lost all their funding. They didn't do what the user was asking for. And that was a lesson I learned now for the, my second career, working with NASA and then coming into the FAA. Next slide. So just a reminder, what's the problem? We've got research, we've got operations. How do we work together? What's a possible solution? Next slide. We've resurrected the community of interest. Maryland, look. Maryland created this logo for us. So thank you very much when she was an FAA employee and working with us. So we've briefed the community of interest before to this audience. We should probably do that again and, and maybe do it every meeting just for an update. We've been working two years now. The idea of a community interest in the FAA is that communication across the agency to break down the silos. It doesn't get you to the end to have a fully integrated, translated capability. But now we've got the researchers talking to the operators, talking to the folks that are supposed to procure and implement the capability, which is a good first step. Part of the problem from the next gen perspective, we didn't know who to talk to in AJVS or AJT. We make phone calls, emails. Now we've got 43-ish FAA employees in the COI right across the agency working together to identify the problems and then eventually get to resolve those problems and end up with a solution, we hope. We've even brought in our stakeholders. We brought in the labs to talk to and brief the COI. We've had AOPA, we've got ALPA, A4A, helicopters are gonna come in and MITRE will be up next in May. We've had Lincoln Lab, had NCAR brief us, Keep trying to get NASA. So we see a broad spectrum of stakeholder problems in the NAS from both the FAA perspective and the user perspective. So I think the COI, which will not end, not under my watch, we're going to sustain it and keep it moving and be a broad way to look at transition and ultimately translation. So I'll stop there. I think that's my last slide. Marilyn said all you had to do was send an email to the administrator of the FAA to get it up and running, which is what she did. 
Actually, it took Matt Fronjak convincing me and Alfred Musakane convincing me we needed to do it, and we did. Okay. So we'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Bill. And uh, our next uh, briefer going to be Mike Emanuel from uh, FA Tech Center in Atlantic City. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the time. Um, I only have three charts, so I'm going to go quick, I think. Um, <clears throat> Better? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, we're really excited about this this project, the terminal precipitation on the glass project. Um, you know, I hear a lot of the discussion here about integration and the history and, and some of the, you know, various aspects of what integration and translation mean, you know, levels zero through four. Um, you know, humbly, this is probably a level one type integration, um, if, if that. Um, you know, it's probably nothing overly complex or overly um, uh, cutting edge, but this project, because of the successes we've had, um, we've addressed a lot of the gotchas and the warnings that were kind of introduced and discussed earlier. Um, and and so, um, it's it's an easy solution. It's it's uh, it, it addresses an operational need. Uh, we have great stakeholder buy-in. We have uh, been properly resourced. Um, and I think the other thing that makes this project successful is focus, right? So keeping your eye on the, the problem that you're looking to, to resolve and not get distracted by, well, what about this and what about that? And, 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 and taking on more than, than you're originally charged to do and, and trying to eat the apple all in one bite. Um, that, that's sort of another another um caution that i would offer to this group in terms of oh matt's driving sorry thanks uh, next slide please um so what is our project uh the terminal controllers um uh, utilize the standard terminal automation replacement system stars as their primary console for tactical air traffic control that platform does provide precipitation information um which is derived from the airport surveillance radar. So the target detection radar that they have in the terminal environment for seeing aircraft coincidentally sees precipitation as well um, as a byproduct. It was never engineered uh, to be a, a weather radar. In fact, it's 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 um, it's sized um, or, or tuned to see a small target aircraft at 20,000 feet, 60 miles away. And then whatever weather precipitation you get, um, that's just bonus. And so utilizing that as the source of precip uh, over the decades um, has has been problematic for air traffic. And over the past tens or so years uh, since the deployment of STARS, numerous problem trouble reports have been um, submitted against the depiction of the weather um, that is on the controller's primary display. Uh, it's not accurate. It's it's unreliable. Um, it's often incorrect. Uh, this graphic here is a is a Greer, South Carolina. Um, uh, it's it's surveillance source is an ASR eight. There's three different models of ASRs that are currently deployed in the NAS, and so um, this line of thunderstorms uh, south of uh, the center of the scope uh, is actually a byproduct from anomalous propagation, where the radar beam bends back down. Um, uh, to the surface due to uh, atmospheric inversions, and it's presented on on the stars display as false weather, and and this happens a lot. Um, so um, this is just sort of the the um, uh, uh, environment that air traffic in the terminal, um, and I'm, I keep saying terminal, um, are, are faced with. So organization requested from our mission support group, hey, we really need better weather. Um, and so our mission support group validated that operational needs assessment and said, yeah, you're right. Um, th this is a problem. Um, so we were then charged to, um, execute a campaign where we followed our acquisition management process to define the concepts and requirements that would ultimately lead to a final investment decision. Uh, the first step of that process is to define the shortfalls themselves, right? Um, and obvious to most, uh, particularly those in the terminal environment. Um, the shortfall statements 
are, are pretty basic, but but this is this is the starting point. This is the problem, right? You can't have a solution without a problem. So, the the weather itself is inaccurate compared to other sources. So when you look at the ASR uh, intensity levels compared to the next RAJ, for example, intensity levels, um, they are grossly wrong, um, as well as the location of the weather itself. Um, we talked about the false precipitation. That's another shortfall. Consistency. So we have three different terminal radars providing precipitation on stars, the ASR-8, the ASR-9, and the ASR-11. But within the en route domain, the en route controllers on, on their primary display are actually utilizing next rad based weather uh, currently through warp in the next gen era via the NWP CSS weather uh, platform. So en route is utilizing weather radar based precipitation in the terminal. It's 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 ASR based. So there's an inconsistency there, particularly as aircraft get handed off from uh, one domain to the other. Uh, the last call out from from a, a terminal controller could advise of level two whether he gets handed off en route and you know welcome to my sector extreme preset dead ahead right i mean th th those things happen um and so that that's that's a problem <clears throat> from an operational perspective there's a coverage deficiency the asr radars have a 60 nautical mile range um uh, the airspace though for the terminal um isn't necessarily limited uh, by that by that distance. So there's plenty of airspaces out there that have unique shapes and contours that extend well beyond the ASR coverage. So where you're working traffic in the terminal in those locations, you have zero weather information on the glass. And then finally, the last shortfall that we identified was the availability. So when the ASR is down for preventative maintenance, corrective maintenance, um, you have no weather information. So while we have layers of target detection uh, capabilities through ADSB or uh, transponder-based uh, beacon interrogator radars, if your ASR is down, you have zero weather. So this was the basis of the of the program. These were the needs of air traffic, and and I didn't include it in this chart, but I we put together because one of the challenges we've always kind of encountered is you know what is your requirement would be the question, and the answer has always been better weather. And, and with this, we've actually defined what it means from a terminal precipitation on the glass perspective, what it means to have better weather. Better weather is coverage from my entire area of responsibility, meet my availability requirements, ensure that it is correct and accurate to a truth source, next red, uh, and, and you don't display the false weather. Um, so, so that's the starting point. That's the, the genesis of, of, of everything. Um, and then, you know, working with the users and the workforce and the stakeholders, uh, ensuring that they are part of the process, right? You know, we as the program team don't do the work for them. I'm, I'm a big collaborator. If you're going to be one who's going to throw arrows at me, right? I'm going to want you at the table uh, in the first place to kind of, you know, help me uh, craft the products. Next chart. So what we came up with, and again, this isn't maybe, you know, integration uh, that, that, you know, people are going to write papers about. Um, but it's practical and it's it's executable and and it's going to solve and impact every single terminal controller in the NAS. Uh, so what we're going to do is is take advantage of information that's already out there. Um, you know this whole at notion of infocentric um, uh, awareness and, and distribution of data um, is, is sort of represented here where. Within the next gen platform, we have this higher um, fidelity weather information uh, that again is going to go to ERAM uh, for terminal air traffic control, uh, excuse me, en route air traffic control. It's going to uh, supply information to our decision support tools. Um, so why not utilize it in the terminal? So instead of the ASR based precipitation information, we're going to extract out from NWP and CSS weather the what the information they have already that will satisfy your traffic's requirements in the terminal and put it on stars one of the issues is there's no native interface between the next gen weather platform and stars and this is sort of a uh, a, a byproduct of trying to uh, we were just talking about uh mike bob and i you know bolting on this uh integrated weather capability it, it just it, it, there's no native interface and these automation systems are extremely expensive to modify. So you're not just gonna go, well, recode stars 
and uh, allow for this interface. Um, th there's just no budget uh, to, to support an endeavor like that. So what we've what we've what, what, what we've designed was a solution that takes advantage of emerging infrastructure uh, in the IT world, right? Uh, particularly Amazon Web Services, uh, to move that data that's going to come out of NWP and CSS Weather, put it up in the cloud. This national mosaic of composite reflectivity that that is generated, uh, and cut out the weather information that is is relative to a given Tracon's area of responsibility. We quantize, right? It's 256 levels of reflectivity. Air traffic wants six, and now they're actually talking to us about four. So, what might make sense uh, meteorologi meteorologically uh, to have all that granularity? Air traffic just wants to know light, moderate, heavy, extreme. That's it. Uh, so, we quantize the weather down, and then we code it up in, a, in an interface that um, is already uh, in existence on the Stars platform. So, from a Stars perspective. And this is, you know, it's integration, but maybe not not the way y'all had envisioned. We're just another ASR 11 providing weather data um, that that now is based on next rads, TDWRs, can rads, model data, ob ground based observations. Um, that is more. Uh, it, it is it is more operationally impactful. Um, the discussions earlier about training. So one of the things we've done uh, with this project too uh, is that the, again the user interaction, the user feedback. Is this really what you want? We've executed three separate user assessments. The last one wrapped up about two weeks ago. We brought in 20 field controllers from across the country um, and played them. I think 15 different scenarios of of weather at different locations, looking at you know winter weather versus convective weather, ground clutter environments. Right? You know how do we um, how do we accommodate wind turbine clutters, for example? Uh, siting issues, um, whether or not because the next rad might be behind a mountain ridge and your terminal air airspace is on the other side uh, of that ridge, are there any degradations in performance? So we, we took we took a big look at that, and um, you know the initial feedback we got was you know we'll take this today, right? We 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 need this, you know how fast can we get it? And as we kind of interacted with the other groups based on discussions from the previous uh, participants, um, there became a really, there became an awareness of how this is, is different. And so training, we're, we're not changing the interface, we're not changing any FAA orders or procedures. Uh, from, a, from a controller's perspective, you could sit down at your console and, and you might not be the wiser uh, that you have this improved weather. But it's different weather. It's 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 more. Um, so the next red radar is is more. Um, it's conveying maximum intensity reflectivity as opposed to average intensity reflectivity that the ASRs are providing. So we're seeing a lot more level three, four, five um, precipitation now on the terminal domain, uh, on the on the terminal glass. So all the controllers that we had in, we're showing scenarios of level four, level five weather, which is about 50 dBZ reflectivity for all your radar geeks. Um, we showed that precipitation right over the airfield in Houston and, and planes are just coming in. And we had controllers from Phoenix say, if this was my facility, we'd be diverting right now. Um, and we actually looked at the 3D cross section of the precip and at, 11,000 feet was the heavy stuff, but at the surface, it was like level one or two. Um, so again, it's accurate. It's the correct information because we're providing them a composite reflectivity of the vertical column, um, but it's different, right? So training is going to be key for this and, and, and awareness of how it's different. And when we started this project, we're not changing the CHI, we're not changing orders, we're not changing procedures. You know, training is just going to be, you know, a, a sign off memo or maybe like some sort of computer based thing that you just next through in, in 5 minutes. But th that that just won't be the case because this is going to be that profoundly different. So to again, reinforce the earlier comment about, you know, the, the importance of training, uh, even for a, a, a system and a solution like this that uh, again, operationally um, will have no difference, uh, at least from a inter, um, interaction perspective. 
Next chart, I think this is it. Uh, oh, so here's a little eye candy, right? So um, and we have movie loops that really show this because you can kind of see the, air the, the aircraft skirting around. So you look at the ASR weather and you see a, an aircraft just making a, a weird turn that makes no sense. Um, but then you look at the, the terminal precip on the glass presentation and then you see that thunderstorm, right? So um, in, the, in the movie loops, it, it's really apparent. Um, so what this graphic shows uh, is, is our um, virtual radars uh, for TPOG. Um, we defined our performance, we defined a requirement of 80 miles um, for, uh, for, for data quality issues, but this is all virtual. So we can, we're not limited by any physical infrastructure. If we wanted to put 15 virtual radars for a terminal airspace, we, we, we're only limited by the number of you know, ports we can plug into. So here you can see New York, we have extended coverage um, on, on the left-hand panel. You can also notice how the, 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 the precipitation is more filled in and what's more operationally significant, right? And, and this is the, the, the chi that they have for, for the, the star scope. So level one is blue, and then they do this blue with white stippling, they call it for level two precip. Level three precip is blue with more, more heavy stippling. Then level four becomes a mustard color, mustard moderate, and then mustard uh, heavy stippling. So you can see um, that that the the more intense precipitation is more filled in uh, with the t terminal precipitation on the glass product. Which again, b when you watch these scenarios, you kind of see these these aircraft kind of finding those holes. Uh, which on the ASR presentation, it's just okay. He's flying through level two weather. Why 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 do I even care? Why is he asking for or why is she asking for a deviation? And then you look at the precip on the glass product and, and you you can see <laughs> that gap that they're shooting. Um, and uh, now you have that that, that awareness. Um, feedback we got during the demos, again, well, great. You just increased my workload because now I got to call out all this moderate and heavy and extreme precipitation, which is one point of view. But now you can anticipate where those um, route, uh, those uh, reroute requests are going to come. You're going to be able to anticipate the flow of your traffic into the tracom when it comes when when you get uh, when when targets get handed off from from the center because you can see out at further ranges where the actual precipitation is occurring. Last chart, please. Um, so uh, what's what's slick about this? Again, we're just we're taking data that exists in the NAS, throwing it up in the cloud, processing it, and then pushing it down uh, uh, to the to the stars tracons. There's 147 of them. Um, we call it asset light, right? There's there's no equipment we think we're going to have to provision, and asset light is probably even too strong a word. The way we believe we can get this architected, we're going to have a cable that goes from our network router into the tracon to the router of the star's uh, internal uh, local area network. That's it, uh, a cable. Um, and so this approach, this capability-based approach, you know, is something that we think could maybe be replicated through sort of this cloud services for aviation weather that looks at, you know, not a monolithic system acquisition that has, you know, 500 requirements, right? Maybe the next, what's the next low-hanging fruit need from air traffic? Is it microburst on the glass? Is it OPC on the glass? Is it, you know, who knows, right? And that's where the discussions with our air traffic organization and our mission support folks be um, becomes in, uh, critical because we need their advocacy. I have, I had 25 union air traffic controllers in our demos. We have uh, five, currently four national NACA National Air Traffic Controller Association representatives. I got two uh, professional airway systems specialist representatives. So the tech ops side of the house. You know, bring them in, right? Because if if they're if they're championing what you need, you're going to get that upper level um, support as well. Um, and and again, this identify that capability, and, and and this is probably a process we think I think that can be can be replicated. Um, we're going to deliver this high quality weather to the NAS. So now everybody um, that's working tactical air traffic control, whether you're oceanic, um, whether you're one of our um, offshore facilities, en route, uh, term tracon, you're all going to have. The information from, dare I say, this single source uh, in the next gen weather platform, NWP and CSS weather. Um, when we push this data out, the, the the big selling point, right? In addition to 
the, the, the operational needs it addresses, right? Let's not kid ourselves, it's a cheap solution, right? Um, it, it, we, we think that you know, the life cycle cost for this entire effort from the implementation through the recurring costs is, is gonna be modest. I'll, I'll, I'll just say those numbers. Um, some of our telco estimates utilizing the cloud, the telecommunications estimates to move this data, because it's just simple binary data in these weather messages for the entire NAS. To move all this virtual radars, the monthly bill for the entire NAS out of Amazon Web Services is going to be about a hundred bucks. I mean, that's insane. So that's why I say, you know, if you want twenty virtual radars, cost is not going to be your your limiter. It's just, you know, can it, do you have an interface for me to plug my virtual radar into? Um, so that's attractive, right? So when we think about how we want to, you know, perform this integration, um, I I kind of say to my team, we we want to do this without performing surgery on on any of the other dependent systems, right? I don't want to modify NWP and CSS weather. I don't want to modify stars because once I do that, you know, I open up the floodgates for changing a baseline program that costs money. I'm going to probably have to redo all my safety work. I'm going to have to relook at all my training. I'm going to have to relook at all my logistical plans. Um, so to the extent you can keep the dependence, uh, keep your dependent programs uh, pure uh, is certainly desirable. Um, and then obviously, right, you know, the money's nice and, and addresses some, some you know, uh, uh, agency priorities around leveraging cloud infrastructure, but we're, we're, we're fixing the problem, right? Um, those five shortfall statements were the problem we identified to address. And so when we had our discussions, you know, and, and I'm kind of guilty of this too, because now we're thinking about, you know, maybe we can, tailor the floors and the ceilings. Maybe we want to look at changing the intensity levels because, um, OK, we solved this problem. What's next? Right? Well, we didn't solve it yet. Right? We think we have the solution it hasn't been rolled out. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that that's something that we're, we're definitely cognizant of. But we're, we're addressing this problem and now we can, you know, uh, work with those who are um, uh, exploring other needs for dynamic weather, whether weather, whether it's on stars or on ERAM or on some other DST, um, you know, those, those, that, that's, that's the first step. That's, you know, and it's been said, um, but I don't want to imply anyone in this group would do it, right? We're not solutions looking for problems. You've got to be the other way around. Um, and you got to get that user engagement up front. And, um, and, and you gotta, you gotta be your own um, spokesperson, right? You gotta be doing things like this, right? To, to advocate your, your effort, to keep it fresh in everyone's minds. So when uh, when there are budget drills and and executives make the hard decisions, right? I mean, the one comment that I almost challenged Matt on, uh, you know, that FAA is not interested in inter integration. There's just other priorities, right? I mean, you know, I got to make sure I can see my airplanes. I got to make sure my comms are still running, right? Um, you know, whether it is, is, it's an essential service in the NAS, it's not a critical service. So it's always going to take a backseat. Sorry, that's a hard reality. Okay, Mike. Uh, sorry, I have to. Yeah, I'm done. Cut a little bit short. Uh, we do want to reserve a few minutes for questions, although we plan for 15. Uh, I'm going to give a heads up. Uh, we're going to take the next break. Uh, also, 10 minutes uh, from 10 minutes to five minutes. Okay, after Josh's uh, presentation. Next. Okay, uh, Josh, are you ready? Yes, highly. Thank, yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead. All right, folks, uh, in the interest of time, we can just keep moving on, except to uh, make sure that you go through back back through the slides and notice that a, a lot of folks put effort into this. So I, I really loved uh, uh, Bill's opening um, at, the, at the start of this, uh, this session, just because there are some really successful research to operations processes. Um, but, and and demonstrations of that of that research to operations process. So, just to take you through the uh, some of the many projects that are ongoing, because um, I I know that we integrate with a lot of you folks, but it, it's all, it's frequently at different levels uh, across the uh, the research to operations process. So we integrate with different users, different partners at different times. Um, Beta.aviationweather.gov became experimental at the end of last month. That is um, 
uh, we think it's a game changer as far as a, a, a government web um, infrastructure that is mobile friendly and consistent for users. It really reimagines all the current services on aviationweather.gov, meets those services with very little, um, a, a tiny bit of gray area with redundancy, but it, it does think it combines tools. It makes it streamlined. You can view it on your iPhone. I encourage you all to check it out. And with that experimental period uh, over the next several months, you might note that the HEMS tool has been transformed into the GFA low altitude. And that is leveraging the very successful um, framework of the GFA on the website and building all of the HEMS capabilities into that framework. So users, we, we've we seen from AOPA, we've heard from NTSB, we, we've gotten uh, um, requirements from from Bill's group and Randy's, uh, Randy's folks have worked to fund some things. And that kind of work really shows that we're listening to all the users. And that's where that requirements portion of, of what Bill had presented plays in. Our users have screamed at us through webmail for, for I know my tenure at AWC, um, to make it mobile friendly. And this is this is really getting to it using a modern look and feel in the interest of time, if we can move forward. Thank you. Um, and this is, I, I'm with AWC, but I wanna represent a lot of NWS work. The, the folks at, at the Meteorological Development Lab in Silver Spring, Maryland, have done a lot of work with uh, with Jenny Colavito and Randy's group to meet some of the CNV needs. The the sometimes that's clouds and visibility, sometimes ceilings and visibility. Um, in in uh, in the case of of the lamp guidance that's expanded into Alaska and really um, improved things as well as. Um, being utilized within the GFALA and current HEMS tool, um, it's it's sealing because the uh, the the scattered nature of clouds um, isn't really a great or the layered nature of clouds is not really a great focus of LAMP. But this is really critical work, getting in the hands of users um, as well as planners. Next slide, please. The uh, the Environmental Modeling Center, um, which is also part of the National Centers of Environmental Predictions, which is uh, the umbrella for, for AWC, um, is also working with AWC and, uh, and other operations groups to march through the ICAO Annex 3 requirements. Um, they're, they're doing work with, uh, with some of the uh, ANGC6 folks um, as well as some internal folks within the weather service, increasing the, the quarter degree WASP products, uh, temporal and, and vertical uh, spatial resolutions. Um, the RRFS is the replacement for the HER or the next gen HER. And we, we heard yesterday reference, uh, I think Brian Pettigrew, uh, Dr. Pettigrew, uh, as I saw in, in, the, uh, in the list, Dr. Pettigrew confirmed that, that that's a, um, a, an implementation for FY24, but there's a lot of work. SIP and FIP have to change. The uh, GTG algorithms have to change. Those are, are being integrated into the post-processing of uh, the RRFS, which um, was referred to with the, the U, as, as part of the UFS, the Unified Forecast System which contains everything from high resolution through the mid range into climate. Um, and then finally, later in 26, we have the ICAO Annex 3 probabilistic WAFS turbulence icing and CB forecast. That work is kind of related. I, I, I found Dr. Carroll's uh, comments about probabilistic um, experimentation and, and some of the discussion about the go, no go deterministic sense. Very interesting. Um, 
because we have delved into some of the probabilistic uh, things and just the way information is presented. And I really think it's in the translation portion that uh, that Bill outlined that we'll find a lot of uh, unmet needs can be met with probabilistic information if we do the translation properly. And that's where our partnership with Audi comes in, the FAA's Aviation Weather Demonstration and Evaluation Group. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm not sure how, how much of this group has heard of the national blend of models, but basically it's this monster blender that takes all kinds of NOAA uh, model information as well as some of the European models. And I, I believe some of the Canadian um, ensemble prediction system blends them all together and gives us this starting grid that is the single source first guess concept. Um, we've had some issues with the operational GFA cloud layering not being able to uh, come out of the NBM. So we, we've done some considerable work at, at, within the aviation weather test bed to um, merge our code um, almost like a meld between the wrap and the lamp models merging that together or melding it into the NBM and really closing that gap between the operational clouds being displayed in layered form um, with bases and tops in the GFA with the grids that the forecasters are using in the weather forecast offices to generate a TAF. So we're working considerably on that. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we're also working on the uh, the convective forecast products and the 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 global ensemble forecast system GEFs is being upgraded. Um, that upgrade requires us to start to look at how our convective probabilistic algorithms are performing. So we've integrated with the hazardous weather test bed in Norman, Oklahoma, at the Storm Prediction Center to do some. Uh, some early um, evaluation and, and starting starting to gather feedback on that model upgrade. Next slide, please. Um, the, the CWSUs that are sort of that, uh, that decision support um, endpoint in the, in the research to uh, operations transition where, where much of the translation is occurring um, have, have largely not been, um, Siri's very interested in CWSUs, if you could hear that. The, uh, the, the CWSUs have, have been um, thrown into multiple systems. So they have, they have not really been studied in terms of their collaborative needs and we're really looking to get to that one unified authoritative source um, of, of a forecast. So we've worked with the operations proving ground within the National Weather Service to look at ways that we can better um, promote that collaboration that needs to happen between the CWSUs. Next slide. And then I wanted to call out the winter weather dashboard because this is a translation product. This is, uh, this is using probabilistics targeted for aircraft, uh, uh, I'm sorry, airport operations, um, decision-making based on probabilities. And there's a, a, a requirement from uh, FAA ANGC6 um, or ANG, I, I, I'm not sure if it's actually C6, so Bill can correct us if we need to know. That requirement is to add Canadian aerodromes. The, the, uh, there are 12 core Canadian airports, and that had to be coordinated through State Department, and actually this whole dashboard had to be rewritten in order to accept new models. Um, so beta... Within beta, you'll find winter weather dashboard output that uh, soon will include Canadian uh, 
aerodromes and and we'll begin evaluating that i know it's getting late in the season but that's okay we have a few months early in uh in winter to be able to make sure that that uh, algorithms are working using real data before we look to make this operational next slide please and um, i think several folks call this epic um, we're, we're going to rebrand it within the Weather Service as EPOC, just so um, the uh, the big NOAA cloud um, epic concept for uh, for UFS doesn't draw away from how awesome this work is. So this is an NCAR multi ensemble algorithm that provides us with that FY26 deliverable to include CB probabilistic. Um, so we are working very closely with uh, with Bill and, and Randy's group. This is a J Jason Baker uh, project to make sure that we're integrating this into the, the new um, supercomputer uh, that NOAA utilizes in order to make sure that that's operational in advance of that ICAO NX3 requirement. Next slide, please. All right, auto automated SIG weather. This is another ICAO NX3 project. It's a partnership with the Met Office. Um, this is this is unfunded work um, externally, but one of, National Weather Service is able to fund this work. Um, and and it it really this is th these are this is automation of the SIG weather charts, and it it's easy to assume. This automation is simple, but it's actually an art form. The way the labels are uh, are laid out in within the gridded um, domains that are established by the Met authorities uh, through through ICAO. So Annex three changes actually is is result those are resulting in a multi year coding effort to make sure this auto SIG weather uh, functionality doesn't degrade what we're providing and instead unifies us across the, the World Area Forecast Center. So this is, again, a partnership with the Met Office uh, in order to meet that, that requirement. Next slide, please. All right, so I, I know we're all anxious to get to the panel, so hopefully uh, we're able to do that and, and we still have some time. Thank you, folks. Okay, thank you, Josh. Uh, so we, we have a few minutes for uh, questions, discussion. Anyone from the uh, online or from the audience here? Yes. Uh, Mike, a great presentation, and uh, I, I like the creative or innovative way that you've got you've uh, integrated this into the uh, NAS. I'm, I'm just wondering, what is the limitation? What what do you see as the limitation? Uh, are the number of capabilities you can integrate like this? Is there a limitation? Yeah. So the solution we we are going to implement is 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 for this one particular product, right? Precipitation. That's what the interface currently is specified to support. Um, we have been talking, and I know this is kind of, you know, there's efforts underway, um, uh, automation evolution strategies, and 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 whatnot. Um, you know, we've had discussions with stars that if they wanted the next product, could could we could we utilize this same approach and. There's diminishing returns with the limitation of the interface itself. You probably want to implement something that's more um, um, that, that's more consistent with the output of the NWP and CSS weather, right? So you probably we've talked to them about um, if you want gridded data, you probably want to pursue an implementation of a net CDF type interface. If you want alphanumeric data, you might want to look at, we call it IWIXM in the FAA or whatever we call IWIXM uh, in, in the FAA. So, but the data is in, in, in available, right? It's just a matter of getting it, getting it to the consumer. Um, so 
you, you probably got to be creative um, if, if you want to, again, like I said, do this without causing surgery on the on the receive side. Um, but at the end of the day, the right answer, right, is to uh, pursue a, uh, an interface that supports a more direct connection point. Um, and, and that's, again, that's a lot of bucks. I think, I think anything on the star sides that they would consider an enhancement, you could talk to them in about 10 years. So, um, you know, as the agency starts thinking about what's next from an automation perspective, ERAM stars, ATOP, the T systems, um, you know, we should be smart and, and ensure we have, uh, have an ability to, to have that native connection, um, with our, with our weather providing sources. There's also, um, other weather phenomena that this grew out of <clears throat> in the operational needs assessment that Mike mentioned. There's, I think, lightning winds and a few other things. So we have a, a program in our policy and requirements branch called Emerging Weather Requirement Service. And we're tackling each one of those weather phenomena one at a time to see one, does it make sense meteorologically? And do we really understand what the controllers want? So we're gonna be stepping through those different weather phenomena to see how we can put that on the glass similar to the work that Mike's done. Okay, Mike Robinson. Yeah, um, just to follow on Eldridge's question to Mike, um, with the success of TPOG, you know, it seems like an opportunity to, you guys, you already had this in your voice track, Mike, to generalize what, what does it mean to produce or consider light integration of weather? Because we know until we get a new narrative and a new message, weather is still gonna be a bolt on for the immediate future, but how generalizable is this? And we, can we start to identify those those areas across the T's, across the different areas, across accountability for weather uncertainty and risk management to Jim Evans's point, to see if we can build some momentum, get our foot consistently in the door everywhere through this new paradigm, and then hopefully break through to bigger and better things. You know, I, I think, and, and Bill in his, in his branch um, has another project, they, it's called Cloud Services for Aviation Weather, that almost looks to kind of reverse engineer what we did on, on TPOG. Um, you know, I have this notion of, um, I call it a federal, federal enterprise weather cloud, right? If, if, if NOAA's got all their information in the cloud and, and Air Force weather has, you know, they're running their global synthetic weather radar in the cloud and we're exploring cloud services and we have the same sensor information and the same model data, I, I, I right, for whatever my opinion is worth, has this, I have this vision of a Venn diagram, right, where we all have overlapping information sources um, but we have maybe different application specific, um, uh, operationally specific uses of that information. So what I would propose, Mike, is, is kind of what's, what's the next big ask coming from on our side, air traffic, um, and, and see if there's opportunities to, to um, again, as we did, kind of define what that concept looks like, go through the process of the, needs assessment and the requirements definition and look at the range of alternatives um, and, and, and present it. And, uh, you know, if, if we pick the right capability, I don't think it's lightning strikes on stars, um, but if it's, if it's something that, that you know, uh, our, our workforce is behind, I mean, you know, strike while the iron's hot, right? And I think this federal weather enterprise you described, if we want to coin a term for it, maybe we call it something like 4D weather cube. <laughs> Back to the future. Okay, we're gonna probably have the last question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Danny Sams, FAA. Um, I was in the system operation program office back with the whole a ATM weather integration and things like that. And there's a there's there's another group to concern. And and Bill, you know, I think you're exactly dead on. You know, the customer has to be involved from the very beginning. Other stakeholders need to be involved from the very beginning. And we all know the, the FAA acquisition system, for better or for worse, takes a long, long time. And <clears throat> with the uh, the T programs, traffic flow management system, time-based flow management, TBFM, TFMS, we had work packages already planned out five, 10 years into the future. <clears throat> and here comes this next-gen report plopped down and said, respond to this. And it's got all these new things in it. Well, we're on tight schedules. We're overly ambitious as to what we can achieve for and for how much money. And when it comes crunch time, 
we're over budget, we can't deliver, so we're going to cut things. And then all the, that we didn't do gets pushed out into future work packages. And so the new stuff never, ever happens. And I don't know, you know, if, if this group is the one, but how do we overcome that? Um, because, you know, we've been talking about ATM weather integration for multiple, multiple years. And again, I was, I've, I've been on that other side of it. And it's like, unless we do the planning and you have to do the planning with also the clear benefits too. So you have to come with a convincing case or else you're just simply never going to get an audience. How, how do we overcome? Any, any ideas? <laughs> That, but when you say a convincing case to do the research, at least to fund the research side, you, that's where you need that customer. You need the customer screaming for, I need this, I need this, I need this, so that when you're asking for the funding from senior leadership, they know that where the rubber meets the road, they are asking for that capability. But then there's the rest of the problem, like you said, through the acquisition management system, that whole long process after the research is mature to make sure that continues all the way through to the end. And that's all those components of transition or translation that have to be in place up front. But then as you say, oh, something more important came along. Back burner will do that in the future. It, it won't work. And I don't know how we solve that. You know, I might offer, which we get trained on. Uh, we have to take PMP training and Pinbox says there's certain things. When you set up a program plan, the number one thing you have to have is secure the funding. And when I was in private industry, when you have a program, it either gets funded and the money's committed and it, the whole program, the whole project, you tell them how much you need, that money's set aside. We don't get that luxury. When you do a program plan, every stakeholder should be in there reviewing that project plan. We don't do that either. We go to our executives. None of the stakeholders are there when I go through a program plan, and I don't think in most of them, they're not usually invited because I don't think our management wants to take, to take direction, at least upper management, from outside agencies. You can come in there and tell them you've talked to these people, but they don't want to have somebody from another organization or another division come in and tell them this is what we're doing, so they're not invited either. So we don't follow the training we get for successfully taking something through on a program, which is secure budget, all your stakeholders, all the folders, and everything that's taught in the pin box. But, but that is where something like an operational needs assessment comes in. And that's how we You're got there. the San Francisco Marine Stratus Forecast System work done, is we had an ONA that said, this is broken, we need to figure out how to fix it. You know, and we're doing that and got the buy-in. But you're right, it doesn't work that way on all the projects, and it should. You know, there's one other comment, and, and maybe, maybe this is happening, um, and, and maybe obvious. But as we're executing research, I think we, yes, the science, right, is, is important, but we'd probably be well served if we actually utilize some of those research dollars. And I know this gets cute with, on our side, right, with PLAs and using R&D money for AMS stuff, um, but you probably would be well served to put together a high-level con ops, put together a high-level shortfall report. So, okay, great. I just figured out this great science question. And here's why it matters, right? And and utilize that together, right? As as an information package, and not just I fixed your science problem. That you know probably nobody in the budget office, nobody investment planning, has any idea is is an issue in the begin with. Okay, I think uh, with that we'll conclude this part. Thank you very much for all the uh, panelists. Uh, I think we'll have to come back. Uh, 3.20, okay, give us a four minute break. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
it, it, it was me. I said, it, does that include the virtual room or just the physical room? Um, um, uh, unless we can figure out how to teleport a piece of paper to you, I think it's the real room. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 All right. more Thank, I'll, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we're going to ask, uh, both the panel and audience, uh, to be seated. So our next part is about the future of uh, aviation weather from where we are today. And we have four uh, panelists from FAA. The uh, first uh, presentation will be given by uh, Phil Smith. I want to, I do want to remind that we are about 20 minutes behind, but I just got the uh, blessing from uh, Matt and uh, Matthias. We can run this until about 4.20, okay? We do want to leave some uh, more time at the end for give the audience a chance to ask questions. So uh, please be reminded each speaker have about uh, 10 to 11 minutes to do their part. Then we uh, reserve the, the time at the end for questions. Okay, why don't we go ahead to the next slide here. Okay, Bill, if you're ready. I am ready. There we go. Okay. So, so, so the first point I'd like to make is one that I, I highlighted a little bit earlier, which is that from a traffic management perspective, they need the tools that allow them to or give them the options to take advantage of the information that weather forecasts and weather support tools can provide. And, and I think that's a critical part of, of dealing with the problem is, is approaching it from a what, what kind of capabilities can be provided and can we build upon or develop new, new capabilities for the traffic managers that take advantage of the weather. And one point I'd make is that there's been a lot of development of new kinds of concepts over the last several decades, ranging from ground delay programs in the in around 1996 up to work that's going on right now with the development of surface CDM within F, uh, TFDM. And, and so um, we need to always be asking the question, what can the traffic managers do or can we enhance what they can do that takes advantage of the capabilities that, that the aviation weather community can provide them with? Next slide. So Bill Lieber suggested that the traffic manager needs to be a probabilistic manager. Uh, Jim Evans suggested that a challenge is turning probabilistic forecasts into deterministic solutions. And I think those are critical questions when you're asking the question, how can aviation weather support um, how can we have true ATM um, um, TFM integration? Um, and so uh, one key concept here is, is time varying uncertainty. So emphasizing that the decision that a traffic manager is making is not simply um, what should I do now, but they are strategically planning and looking at contingencies and trying to decide what should I decide now that gives me the options to deal with however the weather truly develops. And that kind of perspective of, of a transition or support of strategic down to tactical decisions is important. And then a second, which I'll talk about more and in, in a second here, is the idea that um, in order to deal with this uncertainty about the future, a primary traffic manager perspective, which oftentimes is sort of hidden in the background, is the need to develop reservoirs that the, give them the ability to actually adapt and increase traffic in a particular area or decrease it, and whether that's by rerouting or holding flights in the ground or a variety of other kinds of strategies, um, how do we allow them to develop reservoirs and how can weather information help them to determine what the size and nature of those reservoirs ought to be? And, and so again, the next set of bullets dealing with solutions indicate again that, that these traffic managers are dealing with everything from strategic planning to monitoring what is happening, what's the situation assessment, to tactical adaptation. And it's that full cycle, cycle that's continually happening that is really the job that the traffic manager has. So um, the perspective I want to suggest that, that needs to be adopted or considered is that the goal of strategic traffic management management initiatives should be to produce reservoirs that allow us to manage the inventories tactically. And that's a different labeling or perspective than simply saying, I'm trying to estimate a parameter for a ground delay program, for example. 
I'm really trying to, and an air, or an airspace flow program. I'm really trying to say, what's the right action now that produces the reservoirs that give me the flexibility to deal with whatever happens in the future? So basically, traffic management can be viewed as an inventory or a, re, uh, a reservoir management task. And therefore, it's useful to think in terms of, of weather tools that can support this kind of reservoir management. And, and I, again, I think that's a useful broader perspective to have as people explore new and, and in potentially improved capabilities in the weather arena. Next slide. Um, so to provide a, a simple example of what I mean by a reservoir is here, here's a uh, classic AFPs. So AFP 5 and AFP 8, when these were designed, You'll notice that with AFP A05, Cleveland Center is to the west of, and the flights in, in Cleveland Center that are departing are not included in the AFP. And we're talking about flights that are arriving in Boston, New York, and Washington. And you might ask, why didn't they include Cleveland here? The answer is that Cleveland Center in this particular design is the reservoir. You're managing, you're thinning the traffic from the west of AFP A05, west and southwest. Um, but the flights in Cleveland Center, you're still managing with um, call for release, which means they're pushing back and you're letting them, them depart depending on what the overhead flows look like. That means that I can increase the flow if the weather is better than um, expected with the flights that are out there, or I can decrease it um, by reducing or providing delay to the flights in Cleveland Center. So I have some flexibility. I have a reservoir. And the non-trivial decision is what is a good allocation, what setting of the rate for AFP A05 that gives us that balance that's appropriate. And, and when you talk to experienced traffic managers, they'll say, well, what I try to do is pick a rate for AFP A05 such that the average delay for flights that are included in the AFP are the, is the same as the average delay if weather turns out ex as expected for the flights that are in, Cle in Cleveland Center using call for release. And so that's an example, simple example of explicitly designing a program that supports reservoirs and then the decision making that a traffic manager has to engage in. Next slide. Um, consider this weather um, and what, what implications that has for airport surface management. Next slide. Suppose we have an airport that looks like this. Um, you'll notice that we have in the center there a, a departure runway. We have two taxiways that are feeding it to the north. And suppose that we're dealing with the weather that we just saw in the previous slide. So um, in terms of future concepts, which is the focus of this part of the session, um, we, we look at it and we say we have coming on board in the next two to 10 years. So the number of airports will increase over time, but the first are in the next one to two years. Um, the surface CDM concept, which is part of TFDM, um, allows for strategic planning to produce inventory and that inventory is either at the gates or at the spots to be fed to the taxiways. It's producing inventory that becomes the potential reservoir to feed the actual departure sequence um, off of that, that um, runway in the center there. And, and so what we have is, is a multiple stage process, as it says in the, in the um, bullets towards the bot bottom, where we take TFDM to provide strategic management we use PDRR and a tool such as EDC in order to uh, manage more tactically the rerouting of flights if the weather turns out to be different than strategically we were prepared for with, with, uh, with TFDM. Um, the traffic manager, when the time comes closer to the pushback of a flight, indicates an at or after time, mean, meaning when can that flight, given the inventory in front of it, when can it get to the, the front of the end, the, the beginning of the runway, um, indicates the at or after, after time. Um, EDC potentially could say, here are the alt alternative routes that have been provided in a trajectory option set, meaning alternative routes that have been submitted by the flight operator, integrating their input into the decision. Um, so those, those alternative routes in the toss are submitted. Um, imagine EDC says, if you take route one, um, if you take a, a departure to the north, you have a five minute departure delay. That is your lease time. If you take a route to a specific fix via the west, it's a 15 minute departure delay. If you take a route further west, further south to the west, it's a 20 minute de delay. Now the traffic manager can look at that 
and tactically say which is the best route and it's a no-brainer because they have the actual information as to what the um, off time will be assigned to that flight, the release time. That reroute is made, but now it's fed to another layer, the departure controller, who can further tactically adjust this. So depending on how the sequence, the departure sequences on those two queues have lined up, um, the departure controller can decide um, how, to, how to sequence the flights within each of those queues. And all this means that there are multiple opportunities at a strategic level to say, here's the queue we think, here's the reservoirs we think we need for those two queues. Um, here is our best shot um, a little before pushback. Here's our best shot at, when the flight arrives at the spot, and then we can actually, um, then we're actually, be we become committed or more committed to the departure sequence. And so the point is that this is a continuous process where we need weather data that supports that decision at the strategic level and supports a number of people at a tactical level to make the best decisions in the time frame that matters to them. And as it says at the bottom of the slide, ultimately the goal is to give the departure controller a fighting chance. Okay, uh, next slide. So a richer scenario. So you have probably heard of CTOP and some of its challenges, um, but essentially it is again a method, I would claim, to manage the inventory and provide reservoirs, particularly if combined with potential reroutes, um, to provide reservoirs for trying to manage the traffic in the face of a weather disturbance. And so again, as Bill said, the traffic manager needs to look at this in a probabilistic sense, so it isn't just what's the rate, but what's the implication if I set these rates in terms of how I can move flights or control the actual flows to these particular rates or to these particular um, segments within the CTOP initiative. And the segments are our airspace flow programs um, that are part of a, a CTOP initiative. And so if we go to the next slide, um, the point I'd make here in terms of challenges for the future, but also opportunities, is that we need to set these rates relative to what reservoirs we want to produce. And if we, we've done a study, for example, indicating that if we were to ask experienced qualified traffic managers, what rates would they set? In the lower right-hand corner, it indicates that for 1A, which is the, to the uh, uh, south southwest there, they, they felt that an 80% rate was appropriate. The next one a 70%, the next one a 35, the next a 50, and the next a 40. And in explaining that in these sorts of knowledge elicitation sessions, they identified 12 different factors that influenced the rates that they set in order to manage these reservoirs. And so the weather information is critical and central to making this decision, but it has to be embedded in an, in an atmosphere or a capability that allows them to consider far more than just the weather constraint in a, a strict sense if are flying a single aircraft through there, for example. And then so go beyond the weather constraint and consider things such as are these aircraft arriving or descending in one through one of these these FCAs. And these other factors need to be somehow integrated into the decision making that is made by the traffic manager. And, and so, so the, the broad point I'd make with these several examples is that first, the traffic manager's job needs to be understood as an inventory and reservoir management task. That there are many factors that go into this, weather in many cases being a critical one. And as we develop the weather support tools or weather information to support these, this decision making, we need to realize that it has to fit in with or it somehow work in with the other factors that the traffic manager needs to consider. And, and so that offers interesting challenges and, and opportunities for the future. And I'll quit there. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Phil. Uh, next, we'll hear Randy Bass talk about the findings from FA's uh, Aviation Weather Research Program. All right, thanks. Um, I'm kind of going to deviate a little bit off of that, um, but I think it's still on, on target. Um, you already know what AWRP does, and you know what uh, uh, Weather Technology and Cockpit Program does, so go ahead and skip that, and let's get in the next slide. I think basically 10 years ago when I joined the FAA, we had three groups to contend with. You had general aviation, you had the commercial, and to an extent you had the military that you had to work around. 
this I think this is a really good chart from uh, or depiction from MITRE showing what we what we have now and what we're going to have. When you start looking at uh, you know, supersonic aviation and unmanned balloons and stratospheric uh, uh, aviation and high altitudes and and of course commercial space and and UAS. It's a whole different ball game out there, and we've got to, you know, start working and and thinking about that. And and realistically, if you haven't thought about it by now, it's too late anyway. So go to the next slide. And these are in no particular order, and I think you'll agree after you see them that I certainly put them in no particular order. It's just kind of what I came up with as I was developing this. Um, some of the things that. Uh, our group in the uh, weather research branch are going to be uh, looking at um, uh, here either now or in the future. Uh, some of them may be beyond uh, just uh, uh, our branch as well, but you know, obviously we got uh, UAS weather requirements and standards. Um, things that we're looking at, the lack of observations in the boundary layer. We, there's very little uh, observations out there. Yeah, that's where they're going to be flying. Um, Micro weather and ultra high resolution models, and and you know, we just uh, might have just concluded a, a uh, the first part of a study for us um, looking at uh, I believe a six meter resolution, three meter resolution um, over Raleigh, uh, looking at some uh, different wind speeds and and directions, and the differences that you see even at the uh, street level um, as those uh, uh, winds go through there, it's uh, it, it was really eye opening. Um, to, to see the differences not only in the wind speed but also in the uh, um, in the horizontal or in the uh, vertical direction with uh, you know lifting and 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 winds going down and things like like that um, you know even if, you know across the street um, how can we expect the UAS you know we're trying to develop these standards for UAS how how are we going to have the UAS operators meet those standards when we don't have a way to verify the weather conditions that they need or that they've got to go against? So that's another thing that we've got to uh, we've got to figure out, and that goes back to the lack of observations. And then the uh, operator education, similar to what uh, Wittick's already doing for uh, general aviation pilots, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, um, a little bit later. Uh, commercial space, uh, their terrestrial weather needs. Um, you know, what new requirements going to come from them as that uh, as that industry uh, uh, really expands here in the uh, and it's already expanded, but continues to expand. We've got uh, weather standards for launch, but uh, what about landing and recovery is, you know, have we really thought about that a lot, um, especially on the commercial space side. Uh, you know, maybe we have, but um, I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably some things out there that uh, um, still need some work. Uh, supersonic, hypersonic, uh, transorbital um, passenger flights. Um, you know the composite materials that they're using and the uh, the the engines they use. Are that going to produce new weather requirements? Again, is that something that the FAA's got to really worry about? Maybe not. Um, but I think but I think it's going to come down to us because eventually there's going to be some standards and things that are going to be uh, uh, coming out of that. Next slide, please. Uh, TBFM requirements for uh, convective weather. Um, I believe it was Debbie Kowalski talked yesterday about uh, how much she liked, um, or maybe it was this morning, how much she liked uh, uh, CWIS and COSPA, but that it didn't do a real good job at uh, forecasting uh, you know, those, those uh, popcorn variety thunderstorms. Are we now within that reach? You know the. TBFM forecast for um, accuracy requirement is basically three miles and within three miles and within 15 minutes of, of uh, initiation, four hours out. And it's probably beyond our capabilities right now, but are we getting there? And, and I think I think we're starting to get close uh, with this new satellite data that uh, uh, with uh, goes our capabilities, you know, and. Uh, and maybe eventually a geostationary sounder. I think we can get there with the convective initiation to uh, uh, to at least get close to that. Uh, I think a lot of that's going to be model-based research, 
And uh, so there are some areas that uh, we'll continue to work with, uh, with NOAA on. Um, on the turbulence side, you know, standardizing those intensity values, and, and, uh, and Tammy's mentioned this a couple of times, that uh, you know, right now there, there's a lot of different ways to do EDR. Is, is any of them right? You know, what's, what's the standard? And, and maybe there isn't a, a right way, but uh, can we at least calibrate everything so that it correlates together uh, so that at least we're all on the same page? Uh, certifications. To, uh, and, and how to meet those certifications. We already see that with Taywin and Highwick um, working with the uh, uh, flight standards on uh, you know, new aircraft have the uh, certification standards for icing. Is that going to expand to other areas like turbulence or, or convection or anything else? Uh, what about the UAS and UAM certification? So uh, I, I think we're just hitting the, uh, the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, next slide. Um, space weather needs for aviation. Uh, I told you I was all over the place here. Um, you know, we just hired uh, Samantha Carlson, who was a, our intern for basically two years, to uh, lead our uh, new space weather research program. And a lot of folks said, well, what do you need that for? But, you know, we're, we're starting to see questions about radiation dosage measure, measurements. Um, and uh, and stamp potential standards for uh, the commercial aviation side, um, communication and GPS impact mitigation, um, and maybe there's some other needs on the on the UAS UEM and, and commercial space side. So uh, I think it's going to be a growing area for us. Uh, integrating new data sources and capabilities or into our capabilities. Uh, we're just starting to integrate weather satellite data into uh, a lot of our research, um, icing, turbulence, convective weather, um, all the convective weather's probably been a little bit ahead of the others, um, and C and V. Um, but even right now, we're just looking at pretty much the visible, the visible channel and a couple of IR channels. Well, ABI has 15 different channels on it, on the uh, GOES-R satellite. Um, we should be taking we should be taking a look at that and and how to uh, integrate those uh, uh, different things into our uh, uh, different products and, and capabilities, um, and not just the imagery but the weather satellite data itself. You know we don't do anything with basically out of the uh, polar satellites and the uh, uh, the sounders on them, whether the uh, regular the uh, the Chris sounder or the uh, the microwave. Um, and I say here, one man's tra trash is another man's treasure. The Chris uh, sensor sounder, when it goes over clouds and, or it hits a cloud with the uh, the sounding, it stops and it throws it out. Well, to me, it hit a cloud. We need to know that. We need to, we you know let's take that information. If nothing else, we can make a cloud mask out of that information for uh, ceiling invisibility. Um, and then radar data, you know, assimilated into our into capabilities. Um, CWIS does already integrates TDWR data. Uh, MMR, MRMS, we're doing that. Um, it's a little bit different because they have different needs. Uh, we're getting there. Um, what about commercial weather data and uh, uh, radar data that uh, need to be uh, assimilating that into there as well? And then other things like severe weather algorithm upgrades, um, aviation icing algorithms, and other enhancements into the NWP radar capabilities to, uh, to enhance that. Uh, and of course, LIDAR. LIDAR seems new, but it's really been around for a long time, but we don't do anything with it. You know, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, uh, to, to pull in LIDAR data for, uh, for better wind forecasting. Next slide. And then the non-traditional weather data sources, uh, weather cameras. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about uh, UAS and UAM being weather sensors. Well, is that even going to be available to us, or is that going to be proprietary to the uh, to, to the operators? You know, that's got to be worked out. Is it going to be on every UAS and UAM, or is it just going to be? You know, are they going to just going to have weather scouts? That uh, um, and then again, can we get that data from them? Uh, cell phones, personal observing stations, vehicles. 
if you have one vehicle and you know going down the road in Iowa is probably not going to be a whole lot of help. But if you have a thousand vehicles sitting on I-66, you you take all the temperature data from them. I can guarantee you, you're going to be within half a degree of uh, uh, accuracy, because again, it kind of goes back to the crowdsourcing thing that we talked about yesterday. You know, just the uh, the amount of data. Um, can we leverage other sources of data and, and research? You know, fire weather's really picked up in the last couple of years. Why aren't, you know, can we leverage some of the things they're doing? Can we leverage things that they're doing with renewable energy, with uh, uh, both on the uh, wind and uh, uh, solar side? So, um, you know, we need, to, we need to see if we can do more with that. Um, the numerical weather models themselves, uh, as, as we know, we're going to the uh, Rufus model, and uh, um, that whole set of models will be nested, which I, I know the Weather Service is really looking forward to instead of all the, uh, the different models that they've got because it'll really streamline for them. Um, so that, uh, you know, we're going to go to a three kilometer uh, conus wide, but, but even beyond that with the, uh, uh, into the, uh, the oceanic regions and Alaska and everything else. I already talked about the uh, super high resolution. Again, is that a weather service thing? Probably not. Um, and maybe in some smaller cases, but we're talking, you know, three meter resolution model. The weather service is not going to do that. That's more on the commercial side. But uh, but again, it's things that uh, we need to look at. On the other hand, the FAA can't handle three kilometer resolution in our models or in our uh, systems. We're going to have to decimate that data back to 13 kilometers, um, probably for the next seven or eight years. And we were we had that conversation earlier this morning, or this afternoon about uh, the future and and how different it's going to be and how things are going to stay the same. This is a perfect example of how things are going to stay the same. Um, but is 13 kilometers or three kilometers really the right way or the right resolution? You can make a case that 13 kilometers and, and uh, 35,000 feet is probably okay. You know, a, a plane going 600 miles an hour goes through, you know, three kilometers in something like 12 seconds. You, do you really need that kind of resolution at that, at that uh, altitude? Whereas at the ground, three kilometers may not be good enough. So we've got to, uh, to work at that and uh, say, at what point do we hit those diminishing returns? And, and in some cases, maybe we're there and others were not. Next slide. And then we get into pilot education um, and continued education of, of the traditional pilots, you know, those, the general aviation and the commercial. Um, I, I, I think we're going to continue that. Um, Gary and the Wittick team have done a great job on that. Um, you know, the, the virtual reality that we saw yesterday in the tech talk uh, and other new ways. I, I do totally agree um, sitting, sitting a pilot down and going through a paper product or a book is not the way to go. Um, the virtual reality, I think, is, is a really good way to do it. But why is a flight instructor teaching weather to pilots? Why isn't a meteorologist teaching weather to pilots? If I have a plumbing problem in my house, I don't call an electrician. So I, I just think we're doing that backwards. Uh, and, and, you know, then we get into the education of the UAS, UAS and UAM folks. Um, whether I call pilots or not, we'll see, but I probably are. But uh, if you have a, a general aviation pilot who has trouble understanding weather when it's a life or death situation for them in the aircraft, you think that a, a UAS pilot's gonna really care too much about weather? You know, if the drone crashes, it's not, you know, they don't die. So I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of problems with the way we're gonna be training and we've gotta figure that out and how to train them. And they're, they're controlling, you know, multiple drones at the same time, not just one air, aircraft. And then I put on here, okay, let's say we go machine to machine. We don't even need a pilot. We just go everything machine to machine. We still got the standards that have got to be written into the into that. Is that a, uh, you know, do the people writing the code, the programmers writing that, do they need to know what the standards are and the, and the threshold? Uh, do we need to train them on weather? So 
I don't know, but uh, things to think about. And next slide. It's too bad Joel isn't here because he'd get another dollar for pie wraps. So, the, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about them being accurate and relevant. And, you know, is there really a way to fix the current system? I'm not sure. We've tried for years. I, I think it's completely broken. We need to overhaul it and start it from scratch, but that's probably not feasible. Um, I do like the voice to text ideas, and I think that's a, a really good way to uh, do it. Um, and then I just mentioned on here, you know, going totally automated and taking the pilot out of the equation. I'm not sure that we can, but but realistically, you know, if a if a pilot encounters turbulence or icing or, or convection or or you know IMC conditions, the last thing he needs to be doing is doing a pie wrap, and and that's why you know they need to fly the aircraft and, and then worry about it. Let the aircraft itself um, do the uh, the uh, the pie reps if we can. And I think that's it. So things to think about. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> our next uh, will be some new opportunities brought by the evolving technology. Uh, Bill Bowman. Man, that was a lot of stuff, Randy. You got a lot of ideas. That's job security for the future, folks. <laughs> so I, I'm no expert in uh, the topic I'm going to talk about. I stole a lot of the slides here from our chief scientist, Mr. Bradford, who has been talking about charting aviation's future and where we're heading with that. Um, he's talked in our Tech Talk Tuesday series and also to the weather community of interest. And hopefully some of what I'm about to say will feed into what Alfred's going to talk about for NAS 2035 or, or uh, charting aviation's future. But um, is this an epoch or an epoch or an epic? Uh, I'm not sure. Josh may have to help us with that, but there's this thing out there called S-curve theory. Um, and if we go back to the 1940s after World War II, how did the NAS start operating and working? And where are we right now? We are in our new epic, or just entering it, where next gen is just about done. And now we're going into this new phase, this charting aviation's future. That's where the question mark is up there. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna forecast what we're going to need over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and a lot of it we're going to get wrong. So we're going to have to be agile, I think, as we move forward with this. Next slide, please. A different way of looking at that, if you look at the uncertainty, and then as you move towards the right, as we get more and more towards a performance-based system, I think what we're doing is really hoping to eliminate that uncertainty, and some of that is through probability. but you look at the pictures at the bottom of this slide and the good old black and white picture on the left is where we were 1940s and 1950s and then moved to radar, moved to satellite. And then on the far right, that's the next thing. It's gonna be that infocentric or infosphere where every vehicle is communicating with everything else in the NAS out there. Next slide. This is a similar diagram, I guess, to the one that, that Randy uh, showed us from MITRE. Not exactly sure where this one came from. But again, this is that infocentric NAS. We keep hearing that as a buzz term. And I think we're gonna see that when the FAA does release um, its charting aviation's future. But everything is talking to everything. So the question is, how does weather feed into that? And that's part of the unknown, I think. If we've got system to system communications what piece of weather needs to go between all those different things flying out there from surveying real estate for photography all the way up to the high flyers that randy mentioned we've got semi-stationary balloons hypersonics whizzing by and they're all supposed to be talking to each other in the nas in the future next slide so if we look at the systems at the bottom of this, the implementation, the transformational systems, those are a lot of the acronyms for the different FAA systems. But if we look on the left side of that, what do we have in legacy? It's radar, insufficient routes, voice communications. You know, Randy was just talking about taking the pilot out of the pirate. You know, maybe we go machine to machine. You look at what NextGen has done, where we've gone to more satellite-based communication, performance-based voice and digital. So now we do have machines talking to each other. Automated decision support tools and integrated weather information. So while we haven't completely integrated as we talked before, like with decision support tools, we've got more weather integrated into operations than we did in the past 
where it was more fragmented. Next slide. So we go from next gen on the left now to the future of weather. And these are some notional ideas based on having that infosphere of information. So data assimilation, a lot of which, Randy, you were talking about, assimilating that weather information from different sources now. Not just ASOS, not just radiosonde balloons, but there's all sorts of new observing systems coming along, drones, cameras, and other things that we've talked about. Digital communications, and there's the connected aircraft, sending weather information from system to system, not just ground to whatever's flying, but from whatever's flying to whatever's flying. We talked about highly automated, and Randy, you were just talking about the resolution. You know, what do we need for temporal and spatial? Do you need three meters at 60,000 feet for hypersonics? Yeah, probably not, but you might need them in the urban canyon for a drone flying. Uh, next slide. So this I took directly from Mr. Bradford's charts from, uh, I think it was Tech Talk Tuesday. And this is the notional evolving infrastructure. This is our forecast of what we think things are going to and might look like by the time we get to 2035. I imagine by then if we're doing things like quantum computing, this might look completely different. But the cloud computing is there, and Mike Emanuel talked about that, taking something like TPOG, getting it into the cloud, and then distributing it. Um, microservices, I didn't even know what that meant, but it's actually doing computing in the geographical area where you're working. Kind of goes against other things I learned in meteorology where you've got massively parallel processing systems like the weather services WCOS sitting in two locations in the country for redundancy and everything runs there. Well, now with microservices, you're distributing that out and providing that redundancy geographically across different areas. Um, edge decisions is kind of the same thing where you've got a public private partnership, but again, you've got the information being taken in, assimilated and output back where the action is happening in those geographic areas. We talked about 5G this morning, 4G to 5G to what's after that, the faster communications between all the different things that are gonna be flying in the NAS. Next slide. So weather support to safety risk management. So how are we gonna handle that in the future? The weather service does their uh, decision support services right now. We do that with the CWSUs. You've got people actually talking to the operators as opposed to maybe an integrated capability. But there's going to be more of the continuous data exchange, more of the machine-to-machine -machine automated information going back and forth. Uh, we talked about AI or machine learning. More and more of that is coming down the line. And that gets to automated monitoring by aircraft systems. So the weather information is being fed directly to the aircraft. Maybe the pilot doesn't need to make a decision but it's that data exchange that goes into the aircraft with weather information the aircraft can make some sort of decision. Uh, risk modeling, I think that goes back towards probabilities and things that we were talking about. And then of course, alerting and response will be more automated instead of voice communication, which we're using now. Next slide. So some opportunities for collaboration, uh, specifically looking at weather and what the NAS might look like in the future. Um, the XTM community provides weather services in places that currently does not exist. So again, we're getting back to talking the observations. We've got ASOS's, AWAS's at the terminals. In the future, a lot of things won't be flying in and out of terminals. The ATM community, uh, longer look ahead, supporting PVFM, greater fidelity, the aircraft separation, maybe that is where the higher resolution comes in, even at cruise altitude. The infrastructure, so federated weather sources, that's something that Mike was talking about, that cloud. You take the Air Force and the Navy and the FAA and the National Weather Service and put that in one big federated cloud so everybody's sharing all the information. But then the edge computing would say, you're doing those computations where the things are operating, so it's geographically separated as well. The infrastructure, going back to the microservices, uh, storing and transporting the weather information, again, in the cloud. Um, and air ground data sharing is another idea for infrastructure. Safety management, streaming weather, data to support the real-time monitoring. Again, machine to machine, right to the aircraft, and having really real-time weather data. Next slide. So, Alfred, this is gonna to lead to you. Um, we probably should have coordinated our discussions here. Yeah, I was just thinking. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you follow what up. What Randy just talked about, brought all those uh, 
challenges about, you know, all of them, whatever, you were all laundry list, right? And then Bill's uh, dead centric and uh, the future and all that. So hopefully this will tie things together. Um, but I'll, but I'm speaking from the operational, the, the systems that we have out there and what is planned to be out there. And of course, some vision as far as uh, kind of moving to the next uh, uh, few years, well, I should say to, to 2035, but how do we get there? Next slide, please. So uh, for start, uh, I just wanted to show a couple of roadmap diagrams that this is baseline, basically, basically the latest and greatest that we have that FAA follows essentially, you know, how uh, budgets are paid for and what programs are in existence, what's planned with these diamonds that you see, whether it's IARDs or uh, uh, final investment decisions and all that. This is, these are the processes that we go through uh, in the PMO and of course uh, ATO at large working with ANG and others to uh, kind of get the next thing out there or to sustain that system out there. And a uh, couple of things I want to mention here as it is kind of boring, it, it shows everything is kind of going to the right and continue the same thing, starting from uh, LIDAR, TDWR, well LIDAR, I'll hold on to that, but TDWR and NextRAT and we keep sustaining. We, we continue doing modifications from, on, in the case of radars like the NextRATs, uh, from pedestals, uh, maintenance and radomes uh, and electronics within, and same as TWR. And of course, NextRAT is a tri-agency, mostly National Weather Service, but FAA, National Weather Service, and DOD work on it. And TDWR is FAA owned and operated, but again, uh, uh, shared. Uh, the ASR radars that Mike Emanuel mentioned, uh, the 11s, 8s, and 9s, they're AJ, uh, our colleagues in AJM4. Uh, work with uh, kind of thinking of some sustainments and possibly some modifications or uh, refreshment, but still in the works. Uh, going down to the, the usual uh, basic uh, A sources, A voices, uh, you've heard them all, we've seen them all, kind of they continue the same and, and to a couple of uh, unique ones like JAWS, uh, which is Juno uh, system that was engineered and developed and engineered by NCAR, well, a very safety beneficial system up there in Alaska. And uh, so kind of keeps going. Next slide, please. So these, are, these were the sensors. Now, uh, this roadmap two I wanted to show you is the uh, process, dissemination and processing and uh, kind of non-weather, non-NAS, non but we get services from uh, where things are. So as far as the roadmap goes, you hear a lot about CSS and WP, the plans are, this was started, gosh, I wanna say 10 years ago from the beginning and, and uh, it was contracted out to uh, Raytheon and uh, L3 Harris about five years, seven years ago and they're uh, developing and we're almost there testing and uh, about to get out there. But, but as you can see, it'll be by 2025. And uh, some of the old systems like CWIS, WARP, and the current, when I say or existing systems that are out there providing operational benefit to air traffic will be subsumed by uh, CSS and NWP, ne the, the processing NWP and ingest and dissemination CSS. And a uh, number of newcomers like o OPC, which we have a prototype out there, a great job that was uh, uh, done by ANG colleagues here that uh, it's out there, number of sites and people like that. They just like CBIS, they like CBIS. We heard a lot that, about that. So the, the message I'm trying to give you is Kind of the roadmap as it start, stands right now, things are continuing, sustaining within our budget and and competing priorities. Next slide. So where do we go with this? We looked at some of the uh, the, the new documents, new 
plans from different LOBs, Lawrence of Businesses in FAA, from ANG, the, uh, uh, the, the charting uh, aviation future documents, uh, communications plans and uh, data management new, they're all moving forward to the next generation, if you will, what I mean by 2035 time frame. So in, in looking at all those artifacts, then we started thinking, uh, and what you just heard Randy brought up about, you know, we have the current inventory of what they are, they are, they're there and what the challenges we have. We're thinking of how to kind of look at the future and what can we do? So here's a couple of samples of, and by the way, the weather strategy that we're working, we divided into four segments, if you will, four strategies, starting with weather radar. Uh, so you see on the in the picture on the top left we have TDWR and NextRad. How do we leverage, optimize these radar systems uh, to to kind of do a better coverage? Because we have some redundancies uh, where both radars are are in that region, but we have some lack of coverage areas with none of them are. So how do we utilize? get a synergy out there and optimize and get the best benefit from these radars. Why we sustain them? But the other thing we're thinking of, uh, what new technologies can be, uh, you know, we could acquire. There is a decision point coming up. You may know by 2028, National Weather Service, along with other uh, partners of aviation weather, will be making about the kind of the next thing to next uh, next gen, I'm sorry, the, uh, the WSR idea uh, radars. And at that decision point, we'll see how things will uh, turn. But in the meantime, what can we do leverage some of the, uh, you know, optimize these systems. Uh, another one, for instance, in the middle diagram we show, we talked about MPA, uh, I'm sorry, phased array radars, uh, some X-band and C-band type uh, radar that can uh, do the job and leverage some of these coverage areas. And, and so, but getting out there, what decisions will need to be made, we have to have a realistic benefit case, evaluate candidate, uh, whether radar networks, uh, understand technology, talk to the new technology providers, and uh, and we start with the roadmap you just saw. We kind of plug in and request uh, small, uh, if you will, uh, areas where we think we will change uh, the the route, the, the way, we, the path we're taking in these roadmaps, and start a new decision point, and we start small. Uh, kind of limited funding and uh, seed money to get started on those. And, uh, and if it's beneficial, of course, the cost benefit shows that it's beneficial, we'll move forward. And so the next area, next area, uh, next slide. So some of the, the surface uh, sensors. Surface sensors, uh, again, we talk about uh, the A sources, A voices, uh, what are some of the revolutionary things that we could do to uh, enhance these uh, sensors for surface sensors? And also utilize, we have LIDAR that's only used in Las Vegas, and we have Juno system uh, profilers, anemometers up there in Alaska, they're doing a great job, but can we leverage those type of uh, sensors in different areas? So we're looking at those and uh, a number of other technologies uh, to be included in that. Uh, so again, the, the, the point of it is we're moving towards in enhancing the surface observation to look at some concepts, understand the benefits, and everything again, I'll repeat, must, be, have, a, must have a cost benefit uh, to, to get it approved uh, to follow the AMS process. And of course, AMS has, is a very robust process it takes long, Danny mentioned why is it taking so long, but you know, things come in, new, new ideas come in and uh, we need to do this uh, change or whatever, but it's also tailorable. AMS uh, uh, process is tailorable within 
bounds of the uh, policies, but but there are some things with innovative small builds and uh, experimental and then put it out there for operation, just like some of the prototype systems we have out there. That's how series started. <clears throat> so uh, these are some of the ways we need to provide uh, a path forward and recommend updates to this roadmap, NAS EA infrastructure roadmap that I showed. Next slide. The third area is air observations. Well, we talk about PIREP these days a lot, and Randy talked about, uh, Gary is uh, uh, also passionate about the work uh, on this PIREP, but we have a, and I'm not bringing PIREP specifically here, but we have a PIREP modernization plan also being worked uh, within the ATO, working with other uh, lines of businesses and uh, ANG. Uh, but overall, PIREP now, but what about the future? We, we have UASs, unmanned, uncrewed vehicles coming on board, uh, space vehicles, and so on and so forth. All kinds of new entrants, if you will. How do we get those sensor, those uh, onboard data, or these type of aircraft sensors uh, provide the weather data? We need to have the input from for these sensors to come in uh, whether it's uh, automated PIREP, whether it's human in, in the loop or, or automated version of it, uh, all the above will, will be bombarded with a lot of data coming in. But the sensing and observing systems need to be able to, to accommodate all that. And then what kind of a processing system? Well, if uh, what we're looking at, what we have in our uh, it, is basically an NWP next gen weather processor and some of the uh, the other systems that may continue on for a while, and then uh, bring it into for dissemination and uh, to provide all these air observations out there. And of course, we won't get there if we don't uh, work with the other stakeholders for integration platforms like the DSTs and the ERAMs and. SARS and, and so on, all these uh, traffic flow management type systems as well. So as far as air observations evolution is concerned, again, uh, we need to work on understand the downlink alternatives, uh, understand the requirements and uh, develop some con ops and starting from there and put the sort of the seed in the uh, NAS EA infrastructure roadmap and move forward. And the fourth strategy, last one for weather, is uh, the actual processing and dissemination, where uh, actually uh, it's basically NWP and CSS weather and anything that uh, associated with that, optimize the uh, consolidate modernization by bringing in cloud services. Mike touched about that. Uh, agile development, service-based, all the, the, the real um, kind of technological advances that are being made, and we talk about it at the, the uh, <clears throat> different documents from the FAA Net Centric and uh, the vision documents, we, uh, we work on those. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is on the right side of this uh, slide, we, you see end of uh, as is 2025 uh, uh, titled noted there. We have all these uh, sensors, we, we showed you some of them. All of them will continue on for a while, of course, based on the roadmap. And but we want to move towards the 2035 by optimizing this, right? So that's the idea. And the, the middle one, uh, processing, we'll have OPC prototype, NWP, it was, it was just continuing, by the way, because uh, unfortunately it used to be part of the overall plan of next gen weather processor, NWP and CSS, but due to uh, uh, cost and other communications complications that uh, at the time the microservices and all that was not envisioned, uh, that it was uh, left behind, if you will, and we continue sustainment but we're uh, hopeful to have a kind of move that uh, as well to processing and generation function, some kind of a integration that we're working on. 
And finally, uh, the, the dissemination, all this on the left side of the dissemination, Wimsker will move, uh, will be there for a while and a few other ones, but all these dissemination systems and WIFS, which is a service by, uh, provided by National Weather Service, AWC, uh, will continue as well, the, the access and dissemination. But overall, the idea, the message here is we're trying to say, yeah, we are working towards um, uh, the uh, cloud services to be able to utilize the seesaw that the uh, uh, cloud services for aviation weather. By the way, the main cloud service in the FAA that currently is, uh, it's been out there, but mostly mission uh, administrative type data is FCS, uh, FAA cloud services. And also in the NAS side, we're working the uh, integration of some of these programs early uh, uh, ones that can be moved to uh, a cloud, just like the TPOG. Uh, there's an integration platform called NCIS, uh, NAS uh, Cloud Integration Program. Uh, we'll work that small steps towards bringing some aspects of these systems with, whether it's a AWB, AWD aviation weather display dissemination uh, subscription possibility or other uh, ones like the TPOG can be leveraged to start that, uh, you know, put it out there on the cloud. Of course, uh, TPOG, Mike said that that's what the plans are and, and working towards. Um, and uh, also says weather sensor data observations, radar into the cloud if possible. And finally, microservices I touched on, so I think that's, okay, I have one more. Takeaways, basically actively work with uh, uh, stakeholders, whether it's external or internal, with, with uh, technology providers, service providers, with ANG, ATO, other offices. Um, seek out the implementation improvement tech, uh, and technologies, kind of API development makes it easier for external uh, web-based applications and smartly retire uh, legacy systems. You know, there are ways we can't just, obviously we're not that good of retiring systems in the FAA, but they kind of go on for ever at times, but how do we leverage kind of smartly repurpose perhaps it, if this system can be also leveraged for another capability and then the ones that are not needed then gradually decommission. Um, and I think that's my final slide. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you Al. And uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions, feedback, discussion. Yes, Marilyn. Um, I have a question. Lee, can we can we take Jim Evans' question online, or or are we? Uh, how do you want to work? Uh, uh, I I just have a really quick. Question. Yeah, let okay. Marilyn go first. Okay, I'm um, sorry. And it's for any one of you. Um, we have a new transportation bill with funding, and a lot of the funding is dedicated to. AAM and whatever it might be for the FAA. Uh, can you access some of that funding? Has some of it been dedicated toward the research or uh, whatever your needs are? Because we always hear about funding being at least 50% of the problem. You know, you, you want to do a lot of work and you, you have the capability and the personnel, but you need the funding. Let me <clears throat> see if I, I can answer from what I know from PMO, program operations, and ATO. Uh, uh, that is, uh, that infrastructure bill funding, mostly what's appropriated for FAA, will pay for facilities like uh, con air traffic control centers and buildings and such. Now, whenever, whatever the new facilities or uh, main uh, kind of uh, renewal of those. If there's a system needed, for instance, a new stars or a, a, a display needs to be out there, then we get to work on it. Different offices who are responsible for it, but no, that doesn't come for any of the uh, 
the upcoming efforts that we're thinking of, the ones I mentioned. Yeah, we got zero. I believe Weather Service may have gotten some, some of that, but theirs was for climate change mitigation. But I don't believe, you know, but we didn't get any. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I say that only because, you know, why, why would they give us funding? <laughs> I mean, we, we work with, you know, the AUS, 300 folks doing weather stuff, but they're not going to, you know, that's more of the, you know, Kevin being an advisor to them on some of their projects, but as far as accessing actual funding, no, we're not getting any of that. That so, being said, our funding for 22 um, is, is back to where it was prior to 21. 21, we got you know a 54% budget cut. We're back to where we were, and 23, we're actually in very good shape from a from a funding standpoint compared to the previous year. But, you know, I, I give, uh, you know, NCAR and Lincoln and, and some other groups credit because they actually went to their congressman and said, this was wrong and you need to fix it. So. Okay, Jim uh, Evans. Yeah, I, 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 I guess um, I, I, um, I, I have an observation. Let me uh, see if I can get rid of my echo chamber by turning off. Okay. Can, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're, you're good now. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I want to make an observation. In the last two panels, I heard nothing about ATM weather integration beyond weather on the glass. And yet, if we, we start out by saying it's an important problem. So I, I'm asking, where is it going to be? I, I heard nothing. The second thing is, I want to challenge the idea you can really forecast convection with high accuracy at four hours. Look, there are three problems. Spatial resolution of your numerical model. Do you even know what the environment is? You have no sensing concept that's going to get it at that, that spatial resolution. And the final problem is most of the weather convection is not highly organized score lines. You're talking about growth and decay forecasting for eight generations of cells at least. Is that plausible to do accurately? I, I don't believe this. I think we have to ask the question. If you cannot forecast accurately at four hours, you need to talk about what uh, Phil Smith talked about. How do you manage risk? So Jim, let me take the first question you had there on the integration and why we're talking just about on the glass. So from next gen perspective, our requirements come from AJVS. So what they want is what we should be working on. And as part of our weather COI, that's why we brought all the employees from across the agency together. Number one, to try and brainstorm on what things they need for their operations that we could run as a requirement. But that's why we also brought in Lincoln and NCAR and MITRE to say, here's what we're working on that might not necessarily pertain to on the glass, but there's other things that we're working on that may interest the operators to actually make a requirement out of that for us to do the work on. So we're reacting to what the operators are asking for. But if, if I looked at a post-event analysis of a major convective impact on the East Coast, would I hear, oh, we're making great decisions? Hey guys, can I, can I jump in? It's Mike Robinson. Hey, Jim. Um, you know, you're not wrong to talk about the challenges of making that type of forecast four hours out. But let's just say for argument's sake that we can we can do it. We can predict eight, 15 generations of confective cells in their children. <laughs> I think the biggest thing we're not talking about here is that comes out as a requirement from TVFM. 
if TBFM received that forecast, now the work really starts because what is the what is the process for TBFM to be able to effectively use that information to continue to meter traffic, managing deviations off of a good forecast with proactive incremental decision? You know, there's there's that whole piece where, and I think this is one of the, the challenges that Bill and his group has, where we're getting requirements, but we don't quite understand where those requirements what those requirements really mean. And if the weather requirements are met, we still don't have the solution on the other side to make effective use of those solutions. So this is where I think part of the integration remains stalled. I'll just say it like that. Well, but 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 Mike, we, we, we've hardly seen any significant improvement in convection accuracy in, in uh, over a decade. If well, you go beyond I, don't, I think two, that's debatable. Two hours beyond, <laughs> Have we? I think that's a little debatable. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that's debatable because I think the convective forecast is much better than it was 10 years ago um, and probably better than it was five years ago. And, and I think, uh, you know, the her the her is part of that. But and, and I agree, Jim, we're not going to we're not going to solve that problem in you know three years or five years. It may be 10 or 15 years. I think it is plausible in the future. Um, with with the right observations and and when I you know that was I think that's going to be the biggest the biggest hurdle but I don't think we're going to have a you know surface sensors every you know 40 feet to do that but satellite I think we can get to close to that point will we get to a four hour forecast that will be that good that we can say you know that you know basically on the on the corner of you know Fifth and Smith Rose that that there's going to be a thunderstorm in four hours. I I don't know, but I think we're going to. I, but I think we're going to be close closer to that than we are now. <laughs> well, but but I think but I think Mike hit it right on the head. Then what do they do with the forecast if it is that good? And I'm not sure there's an there's an answer for that yet. Well, I I, I okay, but the the point is this: we we maybe we need to think a little bit about helping deal with with where will we be in 10 years i i mean you know posture it's easy to postulate cows will fly but maybe they won't fly and and we we have a clear mismatch currently um when you look at when i look at, at your sole authority source of for for planning um large-scale programs my heaven the days it looks to me like that's the CCFP. And that's where we are 20 years. And well, Jim, if you put enough thrust against it, a cow will fly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll send you a picture of the cow in my backyard. I even have one already. <laughs> okay, Bob. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on what Mike said about even if the forecast is perfect, what do you do with it? So back in 2012, in my lucky days, we actually integrated, you know, CWIS products that were created into a, an avoidance field, if you will, um, and incorporated those into the algorithms um, for the queuing algorithms, right, for, for TBFM. And so when I saw that four-hour bullet, Randy, it's sort of like a flag race in my head. It's like... Wait a minute. Um, one of the comments we got back is, okay, TBFM is not going to you know, just uh, create these new flight trajectories on their own, right? Any one of these sites is not going to do that on its own. It has to be incorporated into, you know, the, the plan for that center. And then each center is not going to be able to do that strictly on its own either. And that has to be coordinated with the command center. And so the architects at, at the time, the FAA architects at the time, uh, were saying that the culture is that, you know, such wide scoping changes need to come down from the command center through uh, the centers, through, you know, the, the, the lower facilities. And that to the degree that, uh, you know, a center can vector aircraft around um, you know, whether without impacting the overall plan for that center is fine. But as soon as they start to deviate and start to go beyond that scope, 
uh, which is what a, a four hour prediction would really do to you, right? If you start thinking about, oh, I've got an ac a perfectly accurate forecast, four hours, so I'm gonna start affecting change from my facility now, but you, you can't do it right at that moment because there's all these other players you know, involved. So I don't know, I, that, that four hour um, time frame associated with TBFM sort of gave me a little pause just strictly based on the two hour forecast experience that I had, you know, eight years ago. Okay, great. Any other comments, questions? We have a, we have a follow up have question a follow -up from question Michael Split. From Michael Split. What forecast, what forecast is considered a certainty? Considered a certainty? That, said, that said, what would be a skill level, level that is close, level enough close enough versus good enough to act, enough to act as an accurate forecast? It, it's going to be, <laughs> my take on this is going to be depend. Okay, 99% for, for accurate forecast, maybe in some extreme scenarios, still not going to be good, in, uh, good enough because airlines cannot afford the risk of 1%. Okay, thinking about that way. So in weather community, of course, we provide a lot of ensemble-based uh, pro probability forecast. 70, 90% is easily achievable in most cases these days. But when you translate that to operational things that people rely on that that's totally different that that's a different that's there is a human di uh, dimension on that so it's very hard to answer that question probably no perfect answer <laughs> just follow on ask follow what on ask current what forecast is 99 percent accurate no it's not <laughs> no it's far from that you know but uh, what i'm saying usually 80 to 90 percent accuracy is is for many systems. I think I think you can argue that there are forecasts that are 99% accurate. It depends on the scope and what you're, if I'm gonna say it's gonna rain today in the United States, I'm 100% <laughs> accurate. But you know what, there's a range of decisions that you can make. If you caution your decision, going back to Phil Smith's point about incremental decisions and strategic planning, at eight hours out, my, def my definition of what I need to be an accurate forecast is very different than one hour out. And I think that's a point that Bill and Randy were trying to make as well. So this question about what is an accurate forecast, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's contextual. So, um, Everett Whitfield, I want to pile on that just a little bit because something I said earlier. So, whatever percentage of forecast is expected to be one thing or the next, is it more important that you're not taking under consideration the less desirable outcome? As in, if something forecasts to be 80% this way and 20% the other way, and 80% favors your operation, and all of a sudden the 20% happens, and then it's a bad forecast. Well, it's not an accurate forecast. I would still contend it was still an accurate forecast if the event happened that was that was, that was forecast to happen. I think that was kind of what, Mark, you were alluding to earlier. If you have a 60% forecast of rain, and it rains, the 60% is right. But if it doesn't rain, then the 40% is also right. To, yeah, assuming you have the, the forecast accuracy or quality to that level. And so that's getting back to like what Phil Smith was talking about is, is we need how we turn that forecast information into actionable information. And so that, that really does get into sort of the whole connection from here at Weather Research all the way to the operations. And, and Bill, you mentioned you're getting requirements from AJV and I don't know if they're online. I don't see AJV in the room. Hopefully they're here and listening to this. And hopefully AJV is sitting in on AJR's, you know, reports when they do the next day, you know, what Jim Evans was talking about. It's like, hey, we just had an AFP and, and the forecast didn't seem to support what we were trying to do. Now, was that the forecast not supporting it or what they were trying to do? I think it's an open question. But you also have to work it backwards. And, and, and Mike, you know, where he says, I can give you a perfectly accurate forecast at the right scope. Well, I think one of the questions is, well, what can you give me accurately? 
and then I'll go back and design sort of a risk mitigation strategy for operations around what you can tell me to some percent confidence level. But I think one of the big problems now, we don't know. You know, we get forecasts, but we don't really know from the operational level of, of how accurate is this? What is my confidence level? Is it a 40%, 60% certainty or, you know, sometimes it's 50, 50, you know, to, what is my 90th percentile that I get? Or, and maybe that's the wrong number, but what can, can we characterize the quality of the current forecast so that we can design our operations around that? And I think that, that's the better connection between the two. And I, to me, that gets to the ATM weather integration that we really need to get to. And I, and I think you hit, you, you hit on a key word there, current forecast, because a, a forecast that was, you know, may have been a 60% chance eight years ago, maybe that's an 80% chance now because the forecast is better. So maybe that's what we're trying to work towards is not necessarily give any perfect forecast because that's not going to happen, but maybe we you know, increase that probability that the forecast is correct and work it that way. What, whatever better is. So maybe, you know, a six in 10 chance now becomes an eight in chance, eight in 10 chance later as, as you know, the, the forecast get better. Yeah, but I got to agree with Mike here. I think when you talk, we're talking aviation. So more than I think weather accuracy, it's decision, what operational decision is made, what, it, what is it being used for? It doesn't really matter your accuracy. It's is the person that's getting that able to make the decision. So if it's a pilot, you need a forecast that makes sure he does not find the weather that kills him, whether that's getting into icing or uh, visibility. If he's flying VFR, that means he is aware enough, far enough away to see when there's a hazard and uses out the window since he's supposed to be flying out the window, but he should have a forecast that tells him where to look safe enough and far enough away. That's different if somebody's doing traffic management, I need weather enough that I do something else. Each person has their operational decision. And that's why, and Bill said this, and it seems like when we talk weather accuracy and aviation, we get away from it. The requirement has to come from the user and says, I'm not able to do the following task because the information you give me isn't good. And then you go, well, what, what do you need? Why is it not, why are you making a bad decision? And if they can convey that to you, then you know what you have to improve on. So I don't know that there is really a true 100% forecast is an observation, and even with an observation, that changes. So I can give pilots observation data, which they like, but that's what it is right now. Ten minutes, five minutes, three minutes, that observation may not be valid either. But you need those observations at a time where you can make a decision, and that's really what you have to measure on is the operational decision. And that's why I was asking even back with the turbulence. It doesn't matter if there's false alarms, but it does matter if people are doing wrong operational decisions based off the information. Then that false alarm, you matter. If it's not doing anything, it doesn't matter if you give some give bad information, if it doesn't affect or cause a bad operational decision. In the scheme of aviation weather, you need good decisions. As long as you're supporting that, you're meeting what's needed. Can I jump in one more time? This is, this is just a request for, for more research. But it follows on what uh, what uh, Mark and and Gary were saying. So I'm a meteorologist, but even when Mark was saying, you know, 90%, 50%, 60%, my eyes started to glaze over, and I thought, you know, if I'm a decision maker, it's an age-old problem. What do I do with a with a with a probability? Now, machine to machine, but what does that mean? You know, we've been doing some research in recent years where you, you don't you don't start from the probability. You start from each of the ensemble members that could roll up the probability. Each of those ensemble predictions has its own trajectory that could be carried through, translated to the decision, to Gary's point, and then you can roll it up later and just see how these distributions collapse. But when you go and talk to NOAA folks who are working at some HER ensembles, and how many, uh, how many members do you have? Oh, nine. Can you get to 50? No. Can you produce it hourly? No. All right. Well, commercial folks are doing things like that. So, you know, I still think we can get towards probabilities, but it, you know, it gets back to what are we trying to fix? What, what, how are we trying to incorporate that uncertainty in a way that can actually 
be carried all the way through to this, the decision where it's in the end not again translated back to a deterministic no uh, go no go decision. You know, and I think ensembles, true ensembles maintained all the way through are a big part of the future, but they're not on too many people's radar right now. Okay, very good. Uh, donated 45 minutes to you now at some point. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. So I, I suppose to give a concluding remark, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, given that I, I just have a few comments, you know, really uh, probably less than one minute. Okay, uh, thinking back of the next gen, when it initially conceived, uh, the assumption of course is that, you know, future controller gonna, one controller gonna be able to do five to 10 controllers job, you know, in the, 10 years ago, uh, something uh, along those lines. Of course, uh, in my view that the, uh, the the overall ATM weather integration ambition probably too ambitious. We were doing relatively well as presented uh, some of the talks today in the aspect of weather improvement, weather, itself, weather product itself. But uh, we're doing poorly on, you know, going to the next step from translation to this to impact to decisions about tools. So people at the, the operational community complaining about lacking of decision to uh, support tools that are uh, automated. At one point, I remember talking to uh, Frank Brody at the FA Command Center. The actual solution to help to ease the workload is to increase number of forecasters. So that human to human uh, confidence to translate weather information into actionable information. That's still in our system, deeply rooted, okay. So uh, <clears throat> uh, not, not, not mention too much about some, somebody already expressed the, uh, the uh, complexity of funding, agency issues, coordination, collaborations, all these human factors. At the end, uh, when we talk about the future, uh, we also review, you know, roadmap, challenges, uh, new sensors. But one thing uh, I, I do think that might bring new opportunity is really if human factor, well, I'm talking about whether ATM integration, if human factor is such a big problem, you know, can we in some kind of a more controlled environment to take human factor out as much as possible? Okay, for instance, the UAS, the UTM, the uh, US uh, air traffic, uh, uh, traffic management system, in the next decade, okay? A lot of, actually, if you think back, a lot of these uh, so-called uh, self-adaptive automated risk management approach, uh, I would think uh, maybe Jim Evans, you know, in his pre previous Apple presentations talk about these adaptive, self-adaptive, that uh, risk management approach, given the uncertainties in the forecast, those can actually be tested or simulated in UAS. Because one thing could be different from passenger flight in the U.S. is really you can't afford to do parallel experiment okay, with passenger flight, but you can do that kind of experiment with uh, U.S. in a more controlled fashion. Okay, with that, <laughs> I think we have a very, very nice session, and thank you. Uh, the committee gave us uh, more than three hours <laughs> to talk about this uh, topic. Okay, it's not going to stop here. <laughs> no, we, we have we have one more item and then we'll let everybody go do what they normally do. You ready? Oh, yeah. All right, don't leave. You're going to hurt my feelings if you leave. Well, this is what you all have been sticking around for to wait about organizational updates. I'm sure. <laughs> and we had a lot of material prepared for this moment, and maybe I have to hold on to this to make it more workable here. Uh, but given the late time, we're skipping some things. As some of you who attended the fall meeting where we had the technical exchange meeting to talk from a various agency perspective about what the plans are, what they are doing, et cetera. We did a survey after, after that, and uh, several of you responded to it. And so we digested that, and there is actually a lot of things coming out of that survey that we know 
and some things that provides guidance on how to you know move forward and so we won't talk about this but the slide deck will be posted on the fpa website so you can go and look at the responses what people were saying so in the interest of time, we really want to talk about organizational matters. Wait, wait, wait. You need to go back. Many, yeah, I clicked too many times. Yes. Because I was impatient. Why are you impatient? Do you want to go? I, yes. Right. <laughs> okay. So we have been talking about, I think a year ago, about uh, stakeholder gr groups in the steering committee, et cetera, as a means of providing some structure to FPA, and we are talking minimal structure, not like developing a charter and all these things. That is just a lot of overhead. We, we're just trying to create minimal structure to help us secure FPA and its organization moving forward and, and help us shepherd this. Plus, we have a charter already. We, we do have some things on the FPA website, and some people actually have looked at this. And, and some of that, what I'm talking about here, is a little update to it and just you know, trying to make it a little more concrete and eventually we'll update the FPA website. And so it's actually there for, for future. And when you look about FPA, what, what we represent, it's four main stakeholder groups that you see listed there. It's people that use aviation weather information. And you see examples there of airline meteorologists, dispatchers, pilot, flight attendants, air traffic managers, controllers, airport operators, uh, operators and, and even manufacturers of decision support tools and, and, and uh, aircraft, avionics, etc. So that's one major stakeholder group in there. Then the second one is obviously that weather information has to come from somewhere. So they're the producers of the weather information. And that is certainly NOAA, the National Weather Service. It has a piece in the FAA where weather information is being produced. And then there is the private sector out there, out there that is also generating weather information. We should probably have DOD on here if, if their information that, is shared. That is correct, yes. And we can certainly update that. And then we have the aviation weather research and engineering community, the FFRDCs out there. Uh, we have the university researchers. And again, there's a private sector with a lot of companies that do various pieces of research that is, is also in, in that bucket there. And then you have the regulatory standards and policy oversight uh, community, which obviously from the FAA, the flight standards, policy and regulations, et cetera, and then the international organizations and standard bodies. So these are the four main buckets that we see are the stakeholder groups. Within, within FPAR. Within FPA, yes. that is correct, yes. And, and we could probably debate this and add a few words here and there, but yes. I think we're close enough where this is represented. Right. And, and you have seen this before and had opportunity to provide feedback and we have seen little feedback, which means you're all agreeing with Yeah, it, it was an overwhelming amount of feedback that we got on this <laughs> to the point that we were uh, having to think about higher staff for um, using our zero budget. Yes. <laughs> okay. So now in terms of the steering committee that we were thinking of is this group, this committee would help us shepherd uh, the FPA uh, movement. And, and it's really trying to get guidance on what kind of activities should we do, what kind of discussions should we be having. So, and because the uh, committee members represent the different stakeholders, they really provide the conduit for bringing input from their stakeholder groups as to what are the hot items that they are struggling with, that they are needing help with, et cetera. And they can also help us as a council sharpen and you know, diversifying what, what we are trying to do as FPA, really trying to, uh, how should I say this? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I have the same problem. <laughs> anyway, it, it's it's a, uh, a group that will help us shepherd the discussions that we are having, like at these meetings. What are the topics that are important that we need to 
uh, talk about. And e equally, or maybe more importantly, I think is, um, you know, people have said, I, I, I bet you I've heard it a dozen times here already the last two days, you know, we need to do more than just talk. We need to have some kind of an action going forward. And, and I agree, I, I'm, I'm in, in violent agreement, but I don't know how to do it in our current structure without making some really broad assumptions about what that, that, that this particular position or white paper or whatever does in fact represent FPAW because I don't have, we don't have a good way to say with any certainty, hey, FPAW members, do you agree with this? And, and you know, that, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I see this kind of a structure as being useful as far as putting out an FPAW paper and being able to say, yes, the community agrees with this or no, the community doesn't agree with this or the community has mixed feelings about this, and and I, we've we've discussed this some, and I think it's actually a. a but, but I think it more in a sense that these papers are not necessarily saying this is it. It's to stimulate discussions yeah. in a dialogue because there are different imp uh, opinions about it, yep. and the different stakeholder groups may not agree with it. So you can have a majority opinion and a minority opinion and about something. This is looking but very important. Court like yeah. yes, but the important part is to to you know, have a dialogue about it because that's how we learn from each other. It's a give and take and that's how we're trying to, to make progress here. Uh, yeah, you can read it there, etc. But the point is we want to have representation on this. And so we came up with this number 14 and we talked about 14 earlier. I think it was you about the weather community of interest had four, 14 members, official members on it. We did. I think you did, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so initially we started out with equal representation, but then we, we started nudging it because the groups are not the same size, et cetera. And so where we are right now is that we think from a aviation weather user in uh, perspective, we should have four members on it because we don't want to make it too big either because then it becomes hard to manage, so we want to keep it a reasonable size. So we say four members that represent the aviation weather user group, uh, three on the producer side, three on the research side, and then two on, on the regulatory uh, standards and policy oversight, uh, and then the two FPA co-chairs like right now Matt and I are automatically part of this group too. So that would be the 14 members and we say initially that we would have these members give them a three-year term and there is an option for renewal because some people really are engaged and active and we want to keep them around and others are maybe less active and so three years is maybe a good cycle to you know maybe bring someone else on board and the idea is that we would meet a few times throughout the year to stay engaged and ideally at the FPA meetings in the spring and the fall where we are together already we could have a side meeting where we get together and then we meet a couple of additional times either virtually or in person depending on how it turns out but somewhere probably in the, virtually in the summer or, yeah. or, or the winter etc and one could also imagine as we move forward that if this steering group uh, committee is really working well together bringing in topics etc that could take on the form of the planning for the next you know FPA meetings. That is really some of the things that we have been thinking along those lines. No, it, it, it's fine. I think that this is good. We don't I need to go forward. So, but the point at this moment is really we are trying to solicit nominations of self nominations are welcome or nominations of other people that you think should be on, on this committee, on this. Uh, steering committee to help us, you know, at least with an initial selection, uh, start this moving forward. And so you don't have to provide input at this very moment. If you want to, there is an opportunity there to send Matt and myself an email with nominations, self-nominations, but we are planning to send out an email about this to the whole FPA membership uh, soliciting uh, input to eventually come up with a first 
you know, selection of, of steering committee members. And then we'll see how we move forward. And this is not put in concrete. This is a starting point, and we can nudge it in, in various ways as needed. But that's kind of where we see how we will move forward from here. So thank you. Back to you, Matt. Um, so as Matthias mentioned, we have talked about this before. We have, uh, being serious, received zero or near zero feedback on it. So we've chosen to interpret that to mean it's been widely accepted and, and we're, we're ready to go forward. Well, we had discussed this with a few people. So yes. we have solicited direct feedback. We, from some we, we have, yes. Yes, yes. you and I. But, but, but we've received nothing from previous discussions about this with the larger audience. Yeah. Maybe we didn't do a good job Probably. advertising it. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I guess at this point, in the remaining couple of minutes, th does this sound to, to this group or the group online like a reasonable approach with the notion of accomplishing the things that Matthias has, has very eloquently described? Go ahead, Marilyn. Take the, take the microphone in front of you. Thank you. I'd just like to make an observation about the three-year term. Um, it sounds to me a little long, and if I could just offer that, some of the other organizations like ASTM and SAE, their committee officers, if you will, serve two-year terms that can be renewed. So three years sounds like an awful long time. Just yes, uh, I, I can see where you're coming from. We are also envisioning that it's not like since we set this up, everybody will rotate off after three years and then you start from scratch with the next slate of, of members on it. So we anticipate that we have kind of a, a partial rotation in us that we preserve some continuity uh, through time. And yes, if someone decides after two years, they can't do this anymore, they're too busy otherwise, or they don't care, whatever the reason may be, we can rotate people off sooner or later. So, I mean, we don't take this as put in stone. There's flexibility. It's just trying to create a body, a structure that help us shepherd this whole effort. Hi. Would you consider an at-large member? There are probably others like me who do not fit into your defined groups. Can they elaborate on who they are, <laughs> that they don't fit in these groups? Yeah. Hey, can, can you weekend can the microphones? Sorted. Uh, maybe I missed it. Um, maybe it's on your web page, what have you, but have you defined for FPA a mission statement and even more so an objective of FPA? Is that defined? Believe it or not, believe it or not yes. On the website, no, it may not. It may not be worth a hoot, but yes, we have something up on the website. And, and uh, again, motivation. Um, I just love bureaucracy and want to. No, that that's not the motivation. And the, the motivation is, I, 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 we want to be able. So, so we have we have the research community over here, and we have the. Operations, the the, the Met Authority, the, the 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 you know the official provider of of weather information in the NAS over here, and we're trying to figure out a way to to connect them up on a meaningful, routine, effective basis, and and believe that FPA could be that mechanism to connect those two ends up. And and so I'm thinking I'm thinking and and I have a little bit of of involvement in each of these. I'm thinking of ARAM over here. I'm thinking of weather COI over here. And FPA is kind of, you know, the conduit through which communications, official, unofficial, whatever the case may be, take place between those communities. Yes, sir, Randy. 
All right, I, I, I hesitate to ask or to, to mention this. Can you go back a slide? Yeah, that one. So, so under aviation weather research and engineering community, you don't have the program management sector. AWRP, WIDIC. Yeah, we should have an FAA ent entry in there too. So therefore you should have 15 members. <laughs> plus, it, plus, it would break your tie. That was why I hesitated well, we, we, to bring it up because that. I don't want to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We discussed that and, and decided that if we ended up with a tie with that many members over an issue, then it wasn't ready for prime time anyhow. So we should probably keep talking about it. But, but yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah. Question. So where would NBAA fit in your groupings here or other organizations similar to that? Users. But which of the subcategories? I'm not recognizing it. Pilots. Dispatchers, flight attendants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the word airline then is only tied to meteorologists or? Um, yeah. The word airline has no, specific that's, that's... meaning here, so. Yeah, no, no, good. That's a good catch, Tom. That, that should probably just say either aviation or have nothing there. Okay, thank you. That helps. We 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 haven't exactly stared at this for the last six months. Oh, on and off. Well, we haven't stared at it. We've glanced at it on and off. Yeah. Can't hear you online. Yeah, so the comment is that uh, I, uh, that that Trey is a teacher and and uh, doesn't feel like like he necessarily fits in any of these categories. I I think we could bend category three to include Trey. Re redefine. Sorry, not bend. Redefine. Yeah, academia. Yeah, precisely. Yep. Who's that? Flight service. That was for you, Frankie. I, I absolutely that was for you. Would would flight? Well, I think is is flight service a um, a user of aviation weather? I think so, right? We could I, even argue, since they communicate it, that they might even be a producer. But we we could talk about that. The, so the, if they're controllers, then they're they're the users too. And, and I guess I would say, and I was I was being as usual facetious. We haven't spent a ton of we 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 spent some time working on this, and then we let it set it aside, and then we spent some more time, and we set it aside, and now here we are. So don't get hung up over um, I don't fit anywhere in here. We can make we can figure out a way to make you fit. Frankly, frankly, if you're if you're interested in being a stakeholder group member. We make room for you. And, and, and you nominate, and we like you, because by the way, this first go around, we're going to pick the people on the committee. There's not going to be any voting here. This is going to be an, an, an oligarchy is what it's going to be. We'll figure out a way to make it work. What is a member of FPAW? People who signed up on on the FPA website to be informed, get you know what's happening, etc. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we have probably 150, 200. Is Rhonda still on? Yeah, Rhonda. Rhonda what's she the would have the list. I would say it's 150 to 200 people, for order of magnitude. Actually, I'd 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 be willing to wager on the high side of that. Yeah, I actually think we're about 167. And, and Matt, you forgot to mention something. You can sign up for free. Oh, and did I mention anything? It? There's no membership fee. 
That's why we have no budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so our ask of you is if you are even remotely interested in becoming um, a, a, a charter member of the FPAW stakeholder group, send us an email. And tell us what category you think you fit in most closely. <laughs> and, 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 and why the fit isn't very good, and then we'll modify the group definition. That's the easy part. Yeah. The work comes after. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to wrap, Do you want to wrap it up? I think we are already a few minutes over. If I wrap it up, it's going long. Why don't you wrap us up? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Everybody, Thank th you. Th this was a good, a, a good, uh, a good two days. I appreciate your hanging in there, your engagement. Safe driving, safe travels wherever you're going back to. Tom George, God bless you. Safe travels all the way back to Alaska. And it was so nice to see you in person. Oh. Thank you. I, I barely held it together. It was so, so nice to see you all in person. It really was. Thank you for coming by. <laughs>